أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى آله وصحابته ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم إن نعوذ بك من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا اللهم افتح علينا حكمتك وانشر علينا رحمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وصلي اللهم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحابته ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله في قراءة for people that could tell the difference some people aren't used to hearing Warsh although I, th I think Imam Warsh his Qira'a is getting more uh, recognition because of some really good uh, reciters from the east that are starting to recite with it but uh, Imam Warsh was uh, from Egypt and he was a student of Imam Nafi' who was the Muqri of al Madina. And he actually led the prayer for 60 years in the Prophet's Masjid. He was a teacher of Imam Malik. Imam Malik actually is considered from the Qurra, from the scholars that took and uh, were, were uh, masters of the Qira'a. But uh, Imam Nafi was, uh, he was a black man and he was also noted for his, what they say, du'aba. Kanat fihi du'aba. He, he liked to joke, but when it came to the Qur'an, he was um, extremely serious. And he also, uh, he, it was noted that he had a scent of misk that people could smell when he spoke. It really came out of his mouth. It smelled like misk. He had two major students, one. And the qira'at, there are seven Mutawatir, Qira'at Mutawatir. And these can be read in the prayer canonically. And basically, the only ones that we use now uh, are in the Muslim world are the uh, Qira'at of Imam Nafi' and Asim and uh, Abu Amr, which is used in, uh, in Sudan. Um, but m most countries now read with. Uh, Asim and Imam Hafs was the student of Imam Asim. So you have the Qira'a and then you have the, the actual variant of the Qari. So with Imam Nafi' you have the, the two variants, Qalun and Warsh. So Imam Warsh is recited. His riwayah also has uh, the Asfahani variant and the Azraq variant. So even the the, 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 the variants take on nuanced uh, readings also. But Imam Warsh, his variant is read in almost all of North Africa with the exception of uh, Libya, which recites Qalun, and some places in Tunis. But people like in West Africa, in Mauritania, they learn Nafi', they learn both variants. They learn Warsh and Qalun. And the Hafid is only considered a Hafid once he masters both uh, variants. One of the interesting aspects of Imam Nafi's reading is Imam Malik عنه, considered it a Sunnah over the other readings. And the reason for that is that uh, Nafi, and particularly the variant of Warsh, is in the language of Quraysh. So the things that you heard. Uh, the fact that they don't use a Hamza uh, in things like Yuminun uh, and then the Mudud that are very long. Uh, Warsh has the longest of the Mudud. Um, and then also uh, the Imala um, that you hear, which is a, when, when, when the Fatha moves towards a, uh, a Kasra sound. So the uh, Imam Malik considered it a sunnah, and he also, uh, Imam Ahmad preferred Nafi' over the other 
qira'at. He was asked about the qira'at and he said, أُفَضِلُ نَافِعًا وَإِلَّا فَعَاصِمْ If I'd rather have nafi' but if I can't then, then asim is the second reading. But all of them are mutawatira and the Prophet wasallam allowed for variant readings and one of the interesting aspects of that is the fact that ikhtilaf is part of our ummah. So one of the unusual aspects of Islam is that we have without councils, without synods, without magisteria, which are the means that other religions have used to try to create unity, there is a unity in diversity in Islam that you don't find in other religions and that's embodied in the Quran itself. The fact that there are different ways to recite the Quran and they're all correct. And, and so Allah loves diversity and it's reflected in His creation that He's created us with diverse colors, different languages, different uh, habits also even, and uh, clothing and all these things, but also diversity in nature. One of the aspects of modern society is homogenization, which is to make everything similar. So wherever you go, the hotels are the same. We could be in Abu Dhabi, we could be in in Cairo, we could be in Paris. We, it doesn't matter because it's all the same. Uh, the chandeliers are bought from the same company and everything becomes homogenized. Whereas in, in, in our tradition, there's a beauty in these differences of culture and, and um, pronunciations, the way people pronunciate uh, words. And so, um, now the other aspect, and, and I want to, to mention this because I think it's an important point. The, the desire for uniformity is actually a type of, it's a sickness of the heart. You know, when people want everything to be the same, it's a sickness in the heart. And... Uh, Muslims that want every, all the Muslims to behave and act and look and, and uh, be the same are actually reflecting a type of, uh, of illness. And that's why it's important to note this about the Qur'an, um, that even in the recitation, there's difference. Uh, the, the Fatiha, if you hear somebody do the different types of Fatiha, just the Fatiha alone you would be amazed at how many ways the Fatiha can be recited. In Warsh they say Maliki Yomiddin, in Hafs it's Maliki Yomiddin. They're completely different um, meanings, Malik and Milik. Malik is a possessor, Milik is a king or a sovereign. And so the, the, the meaning has changed, but the meaning every king is a Malik and every Malik uh, every, every king is a possessor, but not every possessor is a king. So one is universal and the other is particular. It's an aspect of the king is that he's malik as well as milik. He not only has sovereignty, but he owns everything. And that's in, in the old understanding of a sovereign, an absolute sovereign. So they, they don't, they're, they don't, they're not mutually exclusive. Um, they're complementary meanings because the idea on, on, on yom al-qiyamah, liman al-mulk al-yom, you know, who owns everything on this day. So people, not only do they recognize the milik, but they recognize the, the milkiya of the malik, you know, the, 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 that he possesses everything on the Yom Qiyam. They recognize both aspects, that not only is Allah sovereign, but he's an absolute sovereign. Because some sovereigns, you have constitutional monarchs, you have monarchs that... So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is an absolute sovereign on the day... Uh, of judgment when everybody will recognize that. So that's important. Now, the other uh, very interesting thing about the, uh, the unity uh, in diversity as opposed to uniformity is that our religion is the only religion in the world that is a world religion in that it has many, many followers. I mean, there's sects that might have a type of unity. But it's the only religion where you can go to a masjid anywhere 
irrespective of what type of masjid. You know, it could be a Brelvi masjid, it could be a Diobandi masjid, it could be uh, a Sufi masjid or a Salafi masjid or a Maliki or a Hanafi or a Hanbali or a Zaydi or a Ibadi or Ithna Ashari. I mean, and on and on and on. There's lots of variations of Muslims out there. But what is so fascinating is the Qibla is the same. So all those people that have these different variations of Islam, when they go to Mecca and Medina, they all face the same Qibla. They pray behind the Imam. The basic form of the prayer is the same. There's slight differences. You move your finger, where you put your hands, what you do uh, in the particulars of the prayer. There are some slight differences. But the unity is actually quite extraordinary. There's really nothing like it in any religion. Because the Jews don't all have, they can't go to, the synagogues are very different. There are synagogues where, where the men and women are mixed. There are synagogues where there's a woman who's a, the rabbi or the cantor. Or you go to churches, you might get a rock mass. You might get a very uh, stripped down type of mass. Lots of different things. But with Islam, and the reason you, you don't, and the reason for that is that Islam has inherent antibodies against changes to anything that's essential to the faith. And that is because the Prophet ﷺ put so much emphasis on the fact that the previous religions had changed their teachings. They had changed them. And so people that call for this kind of reformation of Islam today, they... they immediately red flags for Muslims should go up. People that want to change this religion that has been handed down for centuries. There's things that are wrong with the Muslims. But Islam is the same teaching. Nothing's changed. And there's differences of opinion. There's all those things. But that's part of the tradition that there's all these differences. So it's important to uh, remember that when we look, uh, because the qira'at are a very fascinating um, aspect uh, of that. And so it was really nice to hear uh, such a beautiful uh, recitation from uh, the imam. Mm. Now, the, before I go into the actual surah, uh, I wanted to give you... A, what, what would be called a heuristic tool. Uh, it's a type of tool that comes from Ibn Juzay al-Kalbi, who was a Granadan scholar. He was from Spain. Uh, really brilliant uh, scholar. His, his, uh, his tafsir, Tashir al-Ulum al-Tanzil, is a favorite tafsir of a lot of scholars. Um, and uh, there's reasons for that that are quite obvious for anybody that's ever... Uh, looked into it, but it's a very short tafsir, but for some reason he was able to pack an incredible amount of meaning in, in very, very concise uh, phrasing. But he, he basically identifies a means uh, of looking at verses of the Qur'an and understanding uh, the Qur'an. So I wanted to go over that. I wish I had a blackboard because I think it would help um, to do this, but... Um, Basically, the first thing is that the Qur'an is first and foremost a book. In fact, that's one of the names of the Qur'an, Al-Qur'an, Al-Furqan, Al-Dhikr, and Al-Kitab. Those are the four names of the Qur'an. All of the other names are considered adjectives, whereas those are the substantives that identify what the Qur'an is. The Qur'an is... Uh, for, there's difference of opinion, but the dominant opinion is from the, the qara'a, which is a reading or a recital. And the Arabs, the Arabs, one of the most important aspects of the Arabic language is the vastness of it and the ability to say many different things with the same words. But the Arabs use qara'a to mean to recite something like aqra'uhum minni as salam recite to him my greeting. So it doesn't mean read to him. It literally means just say, As-salamu alaykum, fulan yusallamu alayka. So-and-so says, salamu alaykum. So you can say that in Arabic. So when Jibril said, iqra, read or recite, 
the Prophet ﷺ negated both aspects because on the one hand he was not a Qari, he was not somebody who, who read, but nor was he a Rawi, he didn't re recite poetry, he didn't do what the Arabs did in their gatherings because a lot of Arabs memorized massive amounts of poetry and they would be able to uh, read from that poetry or recite it by rote. So the Prophet negated, he said, Ma ana I, I don't know how to read, which is one meaning of it. But the uh, Jibreel salam, said, Iqra again, uh, wa ghattahu, ghattahu, you know, he, he pulled him so hard until he said, Balagamni al juhud, like that I, he thought his sides were going to crush into, he did that three times. And then the revelation begins, Iqra bismi rabbika ladhi khalaq. So the, the revelation begins with Iqra read or recite and it's it's interesting because reading has different elements to it one of the elements of reading is to uh, j just the, the the actual act of reading is quite an extraordinary thing the ability to read signs and this is a lot of interest now in in, in Western um, universities is on semiotics and signs. There's a, in fact, a lot of philosophy now has been reduced to studying signs. Uh, they're very fascinated by this, the ability to read signs, but also to create uh, schemas out of the world, that when we see things, the mind naturally puts things together. That's why we're so prone to conspiracy theories, because conspiracy theories are the way the mind deals with sometimes random events or events that don't really make sense. We try to make sense out of them by creating things that might not necessarily be there. They might be, but they might not necessarily, and oftentimes they're not. But the mind is very good at that, and it's good at reading and interpreting. So when you read something, uh, you, you can read it on a lot of different levels. And obviously... The, the iqra that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling is a new type of reading or a renewed type of reading because ma uh, you know that this is something that your fathers had not been uh, aware of so this re this new reading the qira'a that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about is the idea of reading signs of reading signs. And so the Qur'an, the definition of the Qur'an is that it's a reminder, it's a furqan, it's a standard or a criterion by which you judge between truth and falsehood. It's a, uh, a recital and a reading, so it's both recited and it's read as a book. And what's interesting about that is orality and literacy are the two ways that human beings have existed throughout history. Everybody enters into the world in a state of orality. In other words, they're in a state of uh, being uh, unable to read, illiterate. And, and, and that's the primary mode of human beings. Literacy is something that's acquired, and it's actually acquired with, with difficulty. It's not easy to become literate. Um, you have to understand words and then you need to learn signs. And if you look at children, there are a lot of ways that children can have problems with reading. But reading is actually very miraculous. People don't think about reading very much. But reading is very miraculous. The fact that we can take symbols and that have sounds, uh, phonemes, put them together and create these um, dyadic uh, sounds that then generate unbelievable meaning. The amount of meaning that can be generated with the 28 letters of the Arabic alphabet is beyond belief. Really. It's, it's, it's quite difficult to fathom. And every language has immense sophistication. Even the most primitive languages, in fact, some of the most primitive languages are the most sophisticated languages. So there's no... It's like DNA. It just doesn't get simple. The deeper you go, the more complicated uh, it gets. And so the, the, uh, the Qur'an has all of these elements and then it's a proof of the veracity of the Prophet Sallallahu teaching. But if the ulama define it as being 
something that is mu'jiz, that it incapacitates, it's muhabihi, it's revealed ila Muhammad to the Prophet sallallahu Muhammad, in order for it to be recited, لِلْتَلَاوَةِ وَلِلْتَعَبُّدِ Sidi Abdullah ibn Hajj Ibrahim says, لَفْلٌ مُنَزِّلُونَ عَلَى مُحَمَّدِ لِأَجْلِ التَّلَاوَةِ وَلِلْتَعَبُّدِ That it's something that was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam in order for it to be recited and as a way of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and drawing near to Allah by following its injunctions, avoiding its prohibitions, understanding its meaning. And so when you look at, you know, if, 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 if you want uh, a definition of Qur'an, that's, that's one definition. That's the standard kind of ulama definition that you'll find in tafsir. But Ibn Juzay al-Kalbi gives a, a very simple definition that I think works incredibly well because one of the uh, important aspects of our religion is that although it's centered around the Qur'an, there is an immense illiteracy about what the Qur'an is. There are many, many Muslims that can read the Qur'an. Some read it very well, but you would... I think be astounded at the numbers of Muslims that have a, uh, a, a, a complete lack of understanding about what the book is actually about. Now I'll give you an example. If you take an average Baptist who's serious about their religion, all right, and I'm talking about Christians that are serious about, they will have, and I'm not saying to do this with the Quran, but they will have a very dog-eared uh, Bible that's been just used over, and you'll see like stickums and cross-referencing and all these, because they go every Sunday and they have a preacher that is cross-referencing and doing, and then turn to James uh, 3.16 and they all turn to James 3.16. There's a study that goes on that is very absent in the Muslim world. You know, a serious study of the book. What does this book say? Now, if you ask the average Christian what Genesis is about, and I'm talking about a devout Christian, they'll, they'll, they could tell you the plot of the book. In the beginning, God created. They'll tell you about the, Adam and Eve. They get out of exile from paradise. They can tell you about um, you know, building the Tower of Babel. They can tell you about the flood. They can tell you all these things that happen. And they basically know the theme of that book. But if you ask Muslims, what is Surah Al-Baqarah about? What is it about? Is there a theme to it? Do you see? And the thing about the Qur'an, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ Quran. You know, don't they think deeply about this book? Tadabbur is to take something to the end of it. You know, the dubr is what's behind. So tadabbur is to really make an effort to get to the end of something, to exhaust it to as much as you're possible to, uh, able to. Now the Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith which is sahih and everybody I think has heard it if they've gone to Jum'ah or مَشْتَمَعَ قَوْمٌ قَوْمٌ فِي بَيْتٍ مِنْ بِيُوتِ اللَّهِ يَتْسَلُونَ كِتَابَ اللَّهِ وَيَتَدَارَسُونَهُ بَيْنَهُمْ That no group of people will get together in a house from the houses of God reciting the book of Allah. But then it says, يَتَدَارَسُونَهُ Now, tadarus in Arabic is, uh, in sarf, it's used for musharaka, when people actually work together to understand something. What's happened in our community is we have created these, these uh, approaches to the book in which you have a group of people that are called the ulama, and they learn, and they spend a lot of time learning it, and then we go into a passive receptive mode. So people are empty, and the person comes, and they fill them up with information or something like that. And that's one way of learning. And there's no doubt there's benefits to that way of learning. For instance, if you... Grammar is grammar. There's, there's debates about grammar. But basically, grammar is grammar. You either know what a fa'il is, or you don't know what a fa'il is. But we're not going to sit around and discuss what a fa'il is. 
Like, what do you think, Zaid? Well, I think it could be, or maybe it's no. A fa'il is, there's a very specific definition to a fa'il. And then it has rulings that go with it. And then the maf'ul. You know, there's mansubat. You learn them. And there's difference of opinion about them. You can get into that. Like some things, they'll differ. Can, can, you, can that be mansub or not? And you grammarians will get into, these are when you get into the inner recesses of grammar. But generally, grammar is something that if you know it, you can teach it. And if you don't know it, you should shut up until you've learned it. You know, it's very important. Because if you don't know what a conditional sentence is, you'll, you'll mistake what people are saying. If you don't, in the Qur'an, you know, the, the most important book for understanding the Qur'an, I mean, I would say, is Mughni al-Labib, which deals with all the... the those like the fa. There's all these different types of fa in the Quran. There's different types of ma in the Quran. There's different types of hatta in the Quran. And you have to work out what, which one's being used here. And they're not always clear on it. Even the mufassirun differ. And sometimes they'll say this is the arjah. This is the dominant opinion. And other times they'll say Allahu alam. And sometimes they'll say يَحْتَمِلَ الْوَجْهَيْنِ You know, it can, you can take it to mean both. It can have both. And there's benefit to that. There's real benefit to that. But it's important to remember that if you don't have the tools of grammar and also balagha. Balagha is very important. I'll give you an example in Arabic. In Arabic, when you read the Qur'an, one of the things that Western people have that they find really problematic about the Qur'an is it's always changing it goes from the first person to the second person to the third person and it's disorienting for Western people because they do not have a rhetorical device that the Arabs use, which is called iltifat. Iltifat is to switch persons. And the Arabs do it for a very specific reason. They do it in their pre-Islamic poetry and, and it's, it's a rhetorical device to cause a type of, to keep the listener's attention, to make them think about what you're saying. I used to have, I had a, a teacher, Allah yarahamuhu, Sheikh Shaybani, he was one of my favorite teachers, but he used to, when he would teach me, he would always pull on my fingers, and sometimes hard, and sometimes he would slap me, like just like he would hit me and say, did you get that? And... I realized it was like the Zen master that comes around with the stick and hits the people doing the Sazen to keep them present because the mind wanders. There's probably some people in here already their mind is wandering and they're wondering what's everybody laughing about. <laughs> because they were somewhere, they were in Fort Hood or who knows where they were. They're thinking about... Uh, this, that, or the other. So it's, it's that technique in the Qur'an is a very important technique. It's right there in the Fatiha. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Mariki Yawmiddin Iyaka. So it goes from Ghayba to Khatab. Iyaka Na'budu Wa Iyaka Nasta'een Ihdina. So right there, and the ulama say it goes from Ghayba to Hudur that you open the Qur'an and you, you open your prayer in a state, you're moving towards presence. So it begins, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. And it's getting, you know, you come in to, with the mercy and then the Jalal of Allah. You know, He's Rabbil Alameen, He's Maliki Yawmi Deen. And then, Maliki Yawmi Deen, I'm going to meet Him, Iyaka. The presence is there. So that is iltifat in the Qur'an. It's, that technique is a device that the Arabic language uses to pull you in to presence, to bring you back. And so if you don't know these things, uh, the Qur'an is a very difficult read. And another aspect of the Qur'an is just the Arabic language. I had another teacher, Sheikh Abdurrahman, who used to say 
العلم بحر بغوص الماهرين فيه تلف اليواقيت والمراجين that knowledge is an ocean and when people that understand it swim in it when they swim in it تلف اليواقيت فيه والمراجين they find pearls and coral and لكنه غير مأمون تماسحه but the sharks and the crocodiles and the those things that will eat you up, you're not safe from them if you don't know how to swim in there. وَلَيْسَ فِي كُلِّ مَوْجٍ فِيهِ دَلْفِينُ And there's not a dolphin in every wave to help you. Right? The Arabs say, دَلْفِين. If you look in, uh, in uh, مُخْتَارَ الصِّحَاح, which is a short, uh, an abridged version uh, by Ar-Razi of the Sihah, which is one of the great books and he wrote it for beginners and he'll have words in there because it was the first dictionary that I really learned pretty well when I was first studying Arabic I spent a lot of time in that but he used to I'd look up a word and he'd say ma'loom like everybody knows it you know like <laughs> I don't know it <laughs> but if you look in this book Mukhtar uh, Siha he says about duchas he says that th- this is a fish in the ocean uh, and يقال له دلفين it's also called a dolphin and it says يُنَجِي الغريق he saves the drowning man يُمَكِّنُهُ مِنْ ظَهْرِهِ وَيُوَصِرُهُ إِلَى الْبَرِّ you know he puts him on his back and takes him to dry land so the Arabs had a good uh, regard for the dolphin and that's why he says that knowledge it's it, there's danger in this ocean of knowledge and there's not always dolphins there to save you because people go astray the Quran everybody in the history of Islam that has gone astray went astray by interpreting verses and hadith in other than the way they should have been interpreted everybody and that's why if you, if you don't know the... And Arabs think they know the Arabic language um, because it's their language. And there's no doubt they know a type of Arabic. They're speaking Arabic even if there's uh, broken Arabic now or there's a lot of reduction in, in, in the Arabic that's used today. But nonetheless, it's still Arabic. And many of the words that the uh, ancient Arabs used are still used in, in Arabia and amongst the Arabs. I mean, Egyptians use words that are Quranic all the time. Um, and even Moroccans, uh, who people would argue in the East, whether that was Arabic or not, it is Arabic. Um, and uh, once you get used to it, you actually kind of, there's some really enjoyable things about Moroccan Arabic. Um, like if a Moroccan gets mad, they say, billati, billati, you know. And they mean, idfa billati hiya ahsan. You know, but they just say, billati, billati, you know, and it just means calm down in Moroccan Arabic. But it comes from that verse, you know, don't get angry, turn the other cheek type thing. So, uh, but you, you'll find hadith, the Prophet said, Allahu as-sariqa yasriqul fatuqta'u yaduhu. May God curse the thief who steals an egg and gets his hand cut off. Now people can say, if you read that, it says if you steal an egg, you get your hand cut off. But that's not what the hadith means. That hadith means that people start off stealing little things, like an egg, and they don't think that it's a big deal, but later on they steal something big and they get their hand cut off. So the Prophet ﷺ used a very abridged, succinct language that had massive amount of meaning. He said, Utitu Jawami al kalim I was given these comprehensive words. A comprehensive word is the one that the, 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 the simplest people understand it at one level, the middle people understand it at another level, and then the arifin and the ulama understand it at a completely different level, and all the levels are valid. And the Prophet ﷺ had that gift. So when you look at this definition of Qur'an, I think it's a really extraordinary definition of Qur'an and very useful. So if somebody asks you what the Qur'an is, you can say that he says 
all of the knowledges are contained in the Quran. And this is, we believe this. We've left nothing out of this book. And so he says, you can talk about this in, you can generalize about it, and then you can go into details. As for a, a general statement of what the Quran is, he says the Quran is da'wat al-khalqi ila ibadati lahi wa ila dukhuri fi dinihi. That that's the definition of Quran. If you want a definition of Quran, that is the definition. It is the invitation of creation to the worship of the Creator and to enter in to His deen. To enter into the deen of His... That's what the Quran is. It's da'wah. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith, he said that the Quran is ma'dabatullah. It's and ma'dubatullah also. That it is a place where one learns discipline and adab, but it's also a banquet. Because the ma'duba is a banquet. It's the place you go where the Sayyid invites everybody to feast. But when you go into the Sayyid's gathering, you have to have adab. And so the Arabs use that word to indicate that it's a place of adab. The banquet is a place of adab. Now what's interesting about banquets, and this is one of the Persian poets says this, Hafil, says, if you realize that the world is God's banquet, he's brought everybody here, and this is his banquet. And he said, and you realize that you were just one of the guests how would you view everyone else? Because everybody's here by invitation of God. It doesn't matter who they are. The Jew, the Hindu, the Buddhist, the Jain, the atheist, everybody has been invited here. And their life is a full life. It's not, you know, we see people at points in time and we assume that that point in time is, is, that's all. Because most exchanges between human beings are utilitarian. I need this or I need that. that that's most exchanges with people. They're u- utilitarian. We, you know, we use people, right? And, and we honor things. If you, if you look how people treat things in their house, they treat them, they don't want to break the vase, so they'd never knock the vase over, but there's people that just bump into other people and push them out of the way. So they honor things, but humans or animals, because animals have rights as well. There's people in this culture, lawyers, that are trying to assert that animals have legal standing and that they should be able to have class action suits and you know, that people, lawyers would act on behalf of the owl or behalf of, you know, there's people that, that's a very Islamic view that we actually do believe. And we know that animals came to the Prophet ﷺ and used him as their advocate against people that were wronging them. We know that the camel complained about being given too much. And the Prophet told the man to not burden the camel with more than it could bear. We know about the gazelle that complained to the Prophet ﷺ that it had uh, some uh, foes in and that it hadn't finished uh, uh, suckling, which is also an indication about uh, hunting. You know, there's laws in this country, the times that you can hunt. Those are, these are very humane Islamic principles, the idea of not hunting out of season because animals have their offspring and they're taking care of them. So if you shoot the doe when it's uh, during their uh, season that they're nurturing their offspring, you've, you've orphaned these animals that don't have... I mean, our religion takes all that into consideration, which is quite extraordinary. So... If, if you look that this is a banquet, that it's an invitation, it's a da'wah. Now, what the beautiful thing about a da'wah is you have like, when you get an invitation, it says RSVP sometimes. You know, responde s'il vous plaît, like please respond. And so it's a courtesy just to say, I can't come. That's what they're asking because, you know, some they don't care. You, don't, you know, whether you just, if you come, let us know. If you don't, don't. You know, you don't have to let us know. But 
the da'wah of Allah is an honor from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he's not only created us and we're his slaves, but he's treated us in this I-thou relationship, to put it in uh, modern philosopher's terms. The, the idea that we are, we have dignity. لَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدم, That we have ennobled and dignified the children of Adam. And so the way we speak to them, the way we address them, يَا يُهَا النَّاسِ Not يَا يُهَا الْحُقَرَاءَ الْحَمْقَاءَ الْغَافِلُونَ You know, you idiots, you fools. Really, it's, it's speaking to them, you know, الْإِنسَان You're something amazing, you know. I'm putting in the earth a caliph. So it's an invitation for all of creation. Meaning here, Al Alameen, Ibn Abbas said that the Alameen are the, the ins and the jinn. Um, even though it contains the meaning of the world, the, 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 the Arabs have different types of plurals. So the awalam is worlds when it's not aql. It, there's no rationality there. So awalam, Allah doesn't say rabbal awalam. He says rabbal alameen. And the alameen are the ins and the jinn. They're the ones that can respond to Allah and acknowledge Allah in a way that's rational as opposed to say animals that are in submission to Allah but they don't have the cognitive understandings that human beings have. They do their tasbih and they do it, but it's not like human beings or ins or jinn. So this is a, an invitation to creation to worship Allah and enter into his deen. And then he says, but this lofty goal necessitates two things. And you have to have them. And all of the Qur'an goes back to these two things. All of the Qur'an. So the first is بَيَانُ الْعِبَادَةِ الَّتِي دُعِيَ الْخَلْقُ إِلَيْهَا وَالْأُخْرَى ذِكْرُ بُعِثْ تَبْعَثَهُمْ عَلَى الدُّخُولِ فِيهَا So the first is to clarify what that ibadah is that they've been invited to. The Qur'an is there to clarify what it is. So it's دَعْوَةَ الْحَقْ إِلَى عِبَادَةِ اللَّهِ They're being called to worship Allah. So the Qur'an is going to clarify what that is. And, and make it clear to human beings what exactly they're being asked to do. And then the other is to mention the bawa'ith, those things that will engender a desire to enter into ibadah. So, and this is, you know, it's interesting. There are certain things that are left, there are certain things that Allah tells you to do and then doesn't tell you why. And then there's other things He tells you to do or not to do and tells you why. So the Qur'an tell, explains to you in some instances why you're not supposed to do this. In Nuhurijsun, min amr shaitan it's an evil thing. It's from the, the works of shaitan. It's going to spread dissension amongst you. Don't do it. Ashtanibuhu, avoid it. So it tells you. And then there's other things like the khinzir. It just doesn't tell you. You can talk about, well, it's because it has trichinosis. Well, now you can uh, eliminate that uh, uh, so there's reformed Jews that say we can eat pork now because in those days, whereas Muslims, as far as I know, we might have some reformed Muslims around. But as far as I know, I don't know of any Muslims that will, uh, will say that. You know, I, I haven't met one yet. But, you know, there's all kinds of amazing things out there. Um, so, but I, I haven't met that. But uh, there are certain things that Allah doesn't tell you. In fact, one of the ulama said that the reason pork is prohibited is because it's the best tasting meat. <laughs> That's, I read that once in a tafsir. I was like, how do you know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> because the Arabs, they say, Aladdu shayma hurima. You know, the sweetest thing is the thing that's prohibited. It's a jahili idea. <laughs> you know, people like to do things they're not supposed to do. You know, you naughty boy. Like that <laughs> so the, uh, there are things that Allah 
told you, and then there's things that he doesn't. And one of the wisdoms behind that is that if everything was explained to you, you, you might only do them for those reasons. But there are certain things you don't know, and then you do them for the sake of Allah only. So there's no musharaka in your, in your intention. There's, there's not like, oh, the prayer's good because you can stretch and exercise. So some people will do the prayer because, well, it's like stretching and exercise. And I've heard people say that. I heard somebody once explain to me that the reason you do sajda is to discharge electricity in your brain. They t- seriously, and they were very serious about it. And they said, that's why. Because in Maliki fiqh, it's actually preferred to pray on, on uh, earth or on uh, straw, like straw matting. And, and he, he was actually arguing that it'll discharge if it's earth or straw matting. Whereas if it's on uh, you know, polyester, it'll make it worse. Something like that. You know, but somebody could be doing that, just doing sajda to discharge. They think that it's a good thing to do. And so there's things that Allah doesn't tell you, but there's other things because people are motivated by, by what? Two things. No, no, no. It's two things. Motivate people. What motivates people? Rewards and punishments. Right. And, uh, and that's why real ethics, you know, Kant, who was a German ethicist, talked about autonomy and heteronomy. That, that real ethics is when you have autonomy, that you're, you're doing things from yourself. You're being good from yourself. Heteronomy is when you're being good because you're afraid of somebody else. And that's why even though it's, the hadith is not, you know, some say it's fabricated, but the meaning is a beautiful meaning. You know, Ni'm al abdu Suhaib. You know, what a blessed servant is Suhaib al-Rumi. Even if there was no fire, he would not disobey Allah. You know, in other words, he wasn't doing what he was doing out of fear of punishment. And there are servants that worship Allah because he's, He's worthy of worship. That's the highest level. Imam al-Ghazali talks about different reasons why people worship. He said there's ibadatul abid that are afraid of being punished. And then there's ibadatul tujar, uh, they want a reward. Like if you do this, you'll get this. And there's people that really get into that. Oh, you get a hundred, then they add them up and have calculators and work out. Like what, seriously, there's people that do that. It's amazing. But there are people that do that. But then he said there's ibadatul ahrar, the, the, the servitude of the free people that have entered into this contract with Allah because they, 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 they want to worship Allah out of love of Allah because Allah is worthy of being worshipped which is the highest. So this is what he says and then he says that as for the ibadah of Allah so okay the first thing is the definition of the Quran. The Quran is the Qur'an is the da'wat al-khalq ila ibadatillah. Right? It's inviting creation to worship Allah and then to invite them to enter into this deen, a transaction with Allah. This deen where you do things and Allah reciprocates. So he says the ibadah is divided into two types. Usul al-aqaid which are the foundations of what you believe, and ahkam al-a'mal, and then the things that you do. So our ibadah is based on two things, belief and action. If, if you want to use a university or a high school metaphor, you have lab, right, where you learn the theory, and then you have lab. So you do the theory, and then you have the lab. You, you learn the theories about how things interact and then you go into the lab and you see it. Our dean has theory, which is things that you need to learn and understand and believe. And, and one of the things about learning these things is they clear up so much trouble for you. Once you learn, I mean, I'll give you an example. Muli al-Arabi, one of, one of the... Uh, really interesting scholar. He lived about 200 years ago in, in Morocco. But he said that he had read the Qur'an 
from a perspective and had a realization that the Qur'an was really challenging human beings to take responsibility. And so he said that anything that happens is really from our own selves. That you, you can't change anything in reality other than yourself. Because if you try to change the world and you haven't changed yourself, you just make a mess of it. Really, you make a mess of it. And there's all these people that want to change the world, but they're so disturbed in their own being. Like the man who's fighting for, to, to uh, eliminate pornography and he's addicted to pornography. This happens. People are contradictions. There's people that uh, are fighting to eliminate domestic violence and they go home and beat their wife. It's amazing. We, we read the same newspapers. Right? This stuff happens all the time. It's, it's so amazing, the contradictions that people carry around in them. And so he said that if you read the Qur'an from that perspective, you know, God does not change a people until they change what's in themselves. Muslims want change in the Muslim world, but they're not willing to change themselves. Right? Really. We wonder why we're being treated the way we're being treated in so many places. But if you look at our societies, look how far we've fallen just as societies. So if you read the Qur'an, the, the most dangerous aspect of the Qur'an is it is criticizing us. The Qur'an is a critique. You can read it and it talks about the kuffar and all the... It's talking about... Read the Qur'an. It's talking about us. It's saying, where are you? Are you one of these people? Are you one of these people? Are you one of these people? It's talking to you. Now you can read it and think it's all talking about these other people and I'm fine. <laughs> and there's people that read it like that. But that's, if you take the Qur'an seriously, the Qur'an is a deeply troubling book. It's a troubling book. It's not, it's what... Houston Smith said, it's not a book you want to curl up at night with. <laughs> and I think that's a really good description. And he wasn't making light of it at all. He's saying, this book is going to challenge you. It's not for entertainment, the Quran. It's, it's not a book for entertainment. So he says that it's to learn these that, that the ibadah has aqaid, beliefs, and then it has ahkam. It has rulings that relate to how you behave. So it has how you perceive the world, which is called right thinking, and then how you act in the world, which is right doing, right behavior. Istiqama in understanding and istiqama in belief. Now you have to have istiqama in your understanding in order for your actions to have uprightness. You can't have, if your actions uh, are not based on your beliefs, you can't act without knowledge. If you look at, if you're building a house and something's wrong, the, the walls aren't matching up, you have to go back to the measurements. You have to go back to the theory behind the house. I mean, every architect knows that. And that's why it's so important. If you look at the first generation, they are the blueprint for behavior. That's why we go back to them. If we look, one of the most challenging things about the Quran, and this is a radical belief about Muslims, Muslims are defeated from their own actions. And if you read the early seerah, all of it, that's what they were told again and again and again. If you're defeated, it's because of your own actions. Don't worry about those people. And this is why when the Prophet ﷺ said that you should go on تَدَعَلَيْكُمْ الْأُمَمْ كَمَا تَدَعَتَ الْأَكَرَةُ إِلَىٰ قَصَعْتِهَا That the time is coming when the nations, meaning the Jews and the Christians, would gobble you up like people come to a plate and devour and consume the plate. They said... Is it because we're few? Look at the question. They didn't say, is it because they're many? They weren't asking about them. They were saying, what's wrong with us? 
Because they had tarbiya nabawiya. They had prophetic training. They knew how to assess the situation. So their question was, Amin qillatin yawma idin ya Rasulullah? That's a logistical question. Problems with the Muslims are never logistical. Bel, antum kathirun. Oh, oh, you're multitudes. You're multitudes. Warakinnakum ghutha. But you're like floth. You're like the froth. There's no substance there. Warakinnakum ghutha ka ghutha as Just like a, a torrent, like when you have a, a torrent come down, like a flood, it creates a froth. He said, that's what you're like. You're like that. It looks like it's substantial, but when you reach out, there's, no, there's nothing there. And then he said something amazing. He said that your enemies would lose awe of you. Which is amazing. Because there was a time when the whole world was in awe of the Muslims. The whole world. They were in complete awe of them. They were worried more about Muslims attacking them. They weren't even thinking about attacking Muslims. They were worried about Muslims attacking them. They were fortifying their cities out of fear that their cities would be conquered by Muslim armies, not the other way around. And then he said something amazing also. He said that the, the disease that Muslims had would be wahan. Wahan. Now, wahan is an interesting word because in Arabic it means dhu'af, like weakness. But uh, Abu Hilal al Askari, who wrote a book called Furuq al Logha, says the difference between weakness, which is dhu'af, and weakness, which is wahan, is that wahan is the type of weakness that somebody who's strong, but they're acting like a weak person. So they have power, but they're behaving as if they were powerless. And what was that weakness? Love of material things and distaste of sacrifice, of, of resistance, which death, just sacrifice. People don't want to sacrifice. So the Prophet identified the problem in the heart. That's where he took everything. And that's what the Quran, if you, if you understand the aqidah of the Muslims, it's a very, very empowering aqidah because it's, it's telling you the problem is not outside of yourself it's in you and if you address the problem you will see that things change around you that is real empowerment because when you're disempowered when you're told that oh the problem is they're too strong or oh you can never do that you don't have enough money you don't have you, it's all outside you're powerless there's nothing you can do but when you're told it begins inside you. That's, that's something I can do. I can't make this army out there disappear, but I can change what's in myself. And then Allah will make the army out there disappear. I mean, this is the Quranic narrative. People, I don't think they, they... I don't think Muslims read it anymore and think about it because a hundred years ago, uh, Shakib Arsalan wrote a book explaining why the Muslims had been defeated and it was all from this perspective and it was one of the most widely read books in the Muslim world and everybody accepted it. Now nobody ever talks about that. It's all outside. It's, you know, and I tried to explain this once to a man, I won't say where he was from, but he said, it's all the kuffar. They did this whole thing to us. And I said, no, 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 they're a symptom. It's like a parasite on a weak body. You know, when you're when you have a compromised immune system, you're susceptible to sickness. If your immune system is strong, then you can ward off. He said, no, 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 it's kuffar. And, and then I quoted him several verses of the Quran, and finally he said, you know, that you're right. The Quran does say that. But the kuffar took us away from the Quran. <laughs> you know, so at that point, I gave up. Now... So the bawa'ith, those things that engender this desire to worship Allah and to enter into this state are targheeb and tarheeb. Yuraghibu, you know, to make targheeb, make you desire something. Raghba and rahba. 
irhab, to create some fear in you. It's an unfortunate fact that the, these hack translators translated terrorism as irhab because it's not irhab, it's, it's, a, it's the wrong word for it. Though irhab is a beautiful Quranic term and uh, it shouldn't be used like that, you know. But unfortunately, we have a lot of, um, uh, you know, these newspapers, like they call fundamentalists usuliyun, which, which is, means that you're, you studied usul al-fiqh. I mean, you can't, you know, you have to be careful with words. Just call them fundamentalist. I mean, there's a whole bunch of <laughs> words that Arabs use that aren't from Arabic, you know, or mabda'iyun or something, mabda'iyun, I don't know. But not usuliyun, please. Now, here, and this is what I wanted to get to because this is very important. All of the meanings of Quran, all of the meanings of Quran are seven. Everything in the Quran falls under one of these seven categories. The verse will either be about one of these or will have more than one in it. But you, everything in the Quran can be read from these seven. This is the heuristic tool that I'm giving you before we go in to the chapter, which I'm not going to finish because it's, it's a very, uh, I mean, Yasin is, you know, it's, 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 it's uh, there's just so much in there. But um, I think this will be useful for you in your study of the Quran, and that's why I wanted to share it with you because it's helped me a lot. The first is ilm al is knowledge of Allah's rububiyya, that Allah is Rabbul Alameen. So there are verses in the Quran, either part or the whole verse, which indicates rububiyya. It's telling you that Allah is Rabb. And Rabb is, most of the ulama say that it's from uh, Rabba, I mean it's, it's from Rababa, but you have ishtiqaq, which the, the, the last letter in the word uh, can be replaced with other letters. So the, the meaning of Lord is murabbi. It's the one that nurtures you. It's the one that takes you through stages of numu'ah or growth. And so Allah, in relation to creation, He is Rabb. Because everything in the world is from His rububiyyah. Even the reason we're here. So much went into creating you. It's amazing what your parents and all their previous and coming together and nine months in your mother's womb with amazing, I mean, if you look at the mitotic cell division, all these things that are going on with the human being, there's an immense amount of, uh, of the power, the divine power that's manifesting in creation, always, constantly. So, ilm al And the second one is nubuwa. It relates to prophets who are in direct communication, direct through angels and things like that. But they're, they're, all of us can communicate with our Lord. And there are signs, but we don't have direct access in the way that we can just simply understand what exactly God is telling us. I mean, how many times have things happened to you and you want to know, what is God trying to tell me? I mean, that's... He's, everything that happens to you is to tell you something, but he's left it to us to try to work it out. But with the prophets, they tell us. And, and they give us this direct, so that we can really understand what is being uh, expected from our Lord and what, what he wants from us. So the nubuwa, and then the ma'ad. So ma'ad is those things, es- eschatology in, in, if you want a big 50 cent word, for things that happen in, in the next life. The ma'ad is when we go back to Allah and those things that are going to happen in the akhirah. And then the ahkam, which are the legal rulings, the injunctions. There are ahkam in the Quran. There's awamr and nawahi, uh, injunctions and prohibitions. And then the wa'ad and the wa'id. And you have to be careful of this because wa'ad is used for wa'id in the Quran. You, but, but there is a difference and it's an important distinction because something a lot of Muslims don't know, and I, yeah, you know, I don't know if the ulama don't tell people these things because they don't want them to misuse them or abuse them, but I always find these things fascinating. Um, and one of them is about the wa'id, but I'm not going to tell you because you have to study to find this stuff out. But, uh, what's that? I'm give this targhib for learning. 
So the, uh, the wa'ad is God's promise and the wa'id is his threat. That Allah threatens us. Do this and I'll give you this. Do this and I'll do this to you. So the wa'id is the threat from Allah. And then finally the qasas. So they're the stories. Now the Qur'an, all of the verses in the Qur'an relate to one of these seven things. The Fatiha contains all seven. And this is why the Fatiha is a summation of all the meanings of Qur'an. The reason Yasin is called Qalb al-Qur'an is because it focuses on the base, the, the three essential aspects of the religion that relate to belief. The heart is the place of belief. And the Qur'an, the three central meanings of Yasin are Uluhiyat, Allah, the Rububiya, the, the Nubuwa, and the Ma'ad. Those, those are the three central focuses and those relate to Aqa'id, to our beliefs, what's in our heart. And that's why it's Qalb al-Qur'an. Yasin is Qalb al-Qur'an because it's about, and that's why it traditionally was read the, the hadith is, is a good hadith. I mean, Imam Ahmed relates it, Nasa'i, Tirmidhi. Uh, you know, there's some weakness in the chain. There's ittirab in the chain and things like this. But one of the madnesses of modern Muslims is this idea of throwing out all the weak hadith. And in the history of Islam, nobody did this. There's no doubt that there's problems with the hadith literature. There's probabilities of... Uh, hadith in even the soundest collections that are not 100%. But you don't throw them out. So the weak hadith, especially if the, 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 the ulama, you know, in, you know, saw good in the meaning and encouraged it, because fadail al-amal, the virtuous actions, you can use weak hadith. We don't use weak hadith for uh, what's called ahkam or aqaid you know, for, for belief type things. But for fadail al-amal, for doing virtuous actions, they're used. And Imam Ahmad in his usul uses weak hadith, which are really hasan hadith. They're less than sahih. He uses them in ahkam. He preferred that over the opinions of men. But there are many weak hadith about Yasin, which indicates, I mean, I've, in, in, uh, I, I did a translation of, the collections of the Prophet ﷺ, and for people from the modern world, so they can understand this, weak hadiths are like C and D in a grading. You don't throw them out. You just don't use them as your example before the class, right? But they're, they're not rejected. That's called F, which is moldua. F fabricated gets F. Now, there are weak hadiths that get D minus. They're still not thrown out because the probability that the Prophet ﷺ said it is still there. So you can't just throw it out because there is a probability that he said it. It's just the probability is not, it's like 70% as opposed to 95%, which is a lot of the hadiths that are ahad in. Al Bukhari or Muslim, or you know, they get like 98, 99. The only hadith that gets 100% is mutawatir hadith, like the qira'at. Um, the, the sheikh that recited for us at the beginning of this uh, learned the 10 qira'at. Why 10? Seven are mutawatira. The, the three that are called ahad are still good qira'at. They're just not mutawatira. So you don't just throw them out. You still learn them. But we recite in canonical prayer, we recite with the qira'at. But in teaching and in other things, they use the ahad and even the shad in Arabic. There are shad qira'at that are still learned because the Arabic is sound and there's meanings in them. But they're not, it's not permitted to use them in prayer or for any canonical purpose. But, but they're, they're just not thrown out. So it's important to note that uh, because it's a big problem. So rububiya is ithbat wujud al-bari. It's what istidlal alayhi bi makhluqatihi. So 
the, the verses that deal with this are to let you know that Allah is, is the one who brought the world into existence and the proof for his existence is through his creation. The word in Arabic, alam, is called uh, ismu ala. It's, it's, it's a type of noun which is called the noun of instrument, like tabi'. You know, a tabi' is something you print things with. Alam is something that you know things with. So the alam is the way that you know your Lord. So, ilm al comes from the world. The way you know, when, when Allah says, yasma' wa yara, that He hears and He sees, how do we know that? How do we know what that means? Because we can see in here, walaysa kamithrihi shay. Nothing's like God. Wa huwa sami' al basir. And yet, see that, wow is isti'naf. It's not, you know, it's literally like it's saying, and yet, nothing is like him, and yet, despite nothing in the world being like Allah, he hears and he sees. Not like you hear and you see, but the only way you could even understand what that means is because you have hearing and seeing. Nothing is like Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that in the Quran. Allah is telling us that there, these, through these verses that Allah has this rububiyyah in the world. And, and that's the way we understand it, is through the alam, is through the creation. So all these verses about winds moving, I mean you read these about trees and looking at looking at the camel and how it's created. All those are to tell you that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that He is the Rabbul Alameen. And then the Nabuwa is to affirm, assert that the prophets are true. And especially the prophecy of the Prophet Muhammad because it's the one that's relevant for us. The, the previous ones were true, but they're, they're, no, it's, 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 they're no longer... Uh, they're abrogated, basically. I mean, that, that's the proper word for it. The, the shara'i alati sabaqat al-islam nusikhat. They've been abrogated. We believe that. There is a, some Muslims, I mean very small group, but there are some Muslims that say that religions are valid. You know, that still other religions. We, we don't say that. That's not an orthodox uh, doctrine. And, and we have to assert that Islam abrogates previous dispensations. But I would add to that, and I think it's important to note, that there is a wisdom, without a doubt, why Allah has maintained the world as it is. And if you lose sight of that wisdom, you can become very arrogant about your own position. Because Muslims fall into the chosen people syndrome. Right? When the reality of it is, most of you are Muslim because you were born Muslim. You didn't even choose, it was just given to you. You know, there's some of us, it actually was a struggle to find it. But it was still a gift. I mean, I see it as a gift to even converts. But still, there was a process that you had to go through. You didn't know certain things. So it's very important to maintain humility with your faith. But it's a great blessing to be from a tradition of the prophets, but... It's the greatest blessing to be from the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, irrespective of whatever is happening to the Muslims. Because the people of truth are often clobbered. I mean, that, that, in fact, when Allah loves you and you're disobeying Him, He usually clobbers you as a way of, of getting you close to Him. I mean, that's one of the ways. And that's why you can't judge people, oh, they're getting what they deserve. No, they might be getting what... Allah wants them to get in order to get close to them and you're the one that's not getting what you deserve. <laughs> People don't think about that, but that, that's, that's a reality. So, how, how much time left? Okay. So, the, the next is the, uh, the ma'a. And then they have karamat. The prophets have these, these miracles. The next is the ma'ad, which is ithbat al-hashar. And then 
that Allah establishes Yom Qiyamah, that we will be raised up. Iqamat al-Barahin, proving that. You know, one of the things about uh, Imam al-Farabi, he was the Imam of the logicians, um, Abu al-Faraj al-Farabi, and he, he was uh, very brilliant. Uh, they say he spoke over 70 languages. Allah I, I knew I knew somebody who's, who spoke uh, 28 languages, so... Uh, I, I couldn't, and I w once asked Dr. Omar how many languages he knew, and he said, living or dead, you know, so, so there are people that do learn lots of languages easily. I was told that if you master three, you can crack the code, and then it just gets easy, um, but the, he once, he, they call him a mu'allim al-thani, which is the second teacher, the first teacher in logic, not anything else. This, the first teacher was Aristotle. That's what the Arabs called him. Um, but he said, I wish that uh, Arist I could meet Aristotle to ask him what he thought of من يحيلي you know, who will bring the bones back to life uh, after they've gone to dust. قُدْ يُحْيِيهَا الَّذِي أَنْشَأَهَا Say he will bring them back to life, the one who brought them to life the first time. And Farabi just thought that was the most brilliant logical proof. It's called an enthymeme where you exclude, you have a minor major premise and then you have the conclusion. So you exclude uh, the, the, one of the premises and you come to the conclusion without showing the full logic of it because of the intuitive understanding of it. But anyway... He, he, the, what, what, what he was saying there was that what God is saying really is whoever can create a thing one time can do it a second time. God created things one time so he can redo it a second time. So that's his proof for resurrection. It's like it was a perfect logical uh, soliloquistic proof as far as Al-Farabi was concerned. So the Ma'ad... The Qur'an deals with the Ma'ad and one of the most interesting things about the pre-Islamic Arabs is they didn't believe in the Ma'ad. All, all the people around the world believed in afterlife. But Arabs didn't believe in afterlife. They thought that this was it. And they actually believed that khulud was the immortality of a person was through poetry. And so shahama in the Arabic language it's being concerned about things that will be remembered for a long time. So the shaham amongst the Arabs was the one that wanted to be remembered by doing great deeds so that he, his praises would be sung by poets. But they didn't believe in Abbas. So it's quite extraordinary that the Prophet ﷺ and the Quran, that he came with this knowledge to the Arabs, but that he convinced them in 23 years. I mean, it's amazing that, that the Prophet ﷺ, it's a proof of how powerful this was for a people that did not believe in the Ma'ad, and within 23 years, all of them believed in it with great certainty. And obviously, the proofs in the Qur'an, there's two major proofs, which is the agricultural proof of just looking at land brought back to life after it's dead with water, but also the embryological proof which is in Surah Al-Hajj, if you look at the two proofs, the embryological proof is a modern man's proof. And now we have cloning, which is amazing. Because cloning, you know, a nashat al-ula is the normal type. وَقَدْ عَلِمْتُمْ النَّشْأَةِ الْأُولَى You knew the first way that you're going to be, that you were created. But there's a second way that you can be recreated. And it's from one the Prophet said that, that, that Allah would recreate everybody from an indestructible seed that is in every human being. And they're going to be brought back to life from that indestructible seed, which some say is at the base of the coccyx, but Allahu Anam. But the point is, is that we now know theoretically that somebody can be recreated from one small it's amazing that they're coming up with this knowledge. It's going to become clear to them that this is true. How did the Prophet know that? That there was a little seed that the whole of the human being could be recreated from. 
So the ma'ad is very important. There are many verses. And then the ahkam are uh, awamr wa nawahi, commands and prohibitions. And they have five types. You have wajib, mandub, mubah, makru, and haram. So those are, everything can be categorized under one of those five things. But you also have in the ahkam, and this is important, you have ahkam that relate to the body, like praying and fasting relate to the body, but you also have ahkam that relate to the heart. And we forget this, that the Qur'an tells us about having khushu'a, about purifying our hearts. These are also prohibitions and injunctions. You're, you are required to work on purifying your heart. You are required not to have pride. Pride is haram. The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever enters into, uh, nobody will enter into paradise if they have a mustard seed's weight of pride in their hearts. He said, Umirtu an atawada hatta la yafkhara ahadun ala ahad. Aw la yabghiya ahadun ala ahad. I was commanded to be humble. Tawada'u ya ibad Allah. Be humble. So pride, all these things, this is a, an important aspect of the Qur'an. Ikhlas. Having ikhlas to Allah. وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ مُخْلِصِينَ They were only commanded Allah. They were only commanded to worship Allah sincerely. مُخْلِصِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ And the religion is only for Him. Everything you do is only for Allah. So having riya in your heart, doing things so that other people say this, that, or the other about you. And then the wa'ad is the promise of the good of the dunya and the akhirah. رَبَّنَا أَتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَةً وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنَةً وَقِينَ عَذَابَ النَّارِ Having good in this world. Victory is promised from Allah. If you obey Allah, if you do what Allah tells you, He will, he will and He'll also, He can stop people from attacking you. He, he kaffa aidihum ankum. Bibatni Mekkata. He stops some people from harming you in that valley in Mecca. He's reminding the Sahaba, don't you remember when they could have caused you harm? Allah stopped them. Allah can stop people from doing harm. He, wallahi, He can pull all these troops out. Allah does everything. Huwa muharrak al qulub. Al qulub. All of the hearts are between, and this is anthropomorphic language, but obviously we understand it to be ma qadrullah haqqa qadrihi. They didn't estimate Allah with true estimation. But it says that the hearts are between the fingers of the merciful. And the heart is how is it made supple? With dhikr of Allah. The heart should be, if it's supple, then it will be molded by the fingers of the Rahman. Allah will mold your heart. But if your heart becomes hard, if there's qasawa, qasat qulubuhum, their hearts become hard, then it's broken, it's crushed by Allah. That's what happens. So your heart should be supple. So that it's molded to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not in this state of harshness in which it's, what is a kamithrihi shay? Nothing like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then finally the wa'id, which is the warning of being, and it's iqab in dunya and akhirah, khizyun. You will have humiliation in this world if you disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now people can say, well why do the kuffar, you know there's people that, are not worshipping Allah and they have all this izza and they, it's not real izza, it's worldly izza. On Yom Qiyamah everything gets switched around. Tyrants are raised up like ants in the akhirah. They're crushed by people. They're insignificant people. So the dunya, if you use the ma'yar or the standard of this world, you can become deluded about our place in this world. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. And then finally the qasas, uh, are the akhbar of the prophets uh, in the Qur'an, all the stories. And it's important. And also the stories of the righteous, like Luqman al-Hakim and the people of uh, Ahl al-Kahf. There's, there's wisdom in their stories. There's things to learn. And also the stories of the destroyed people and why they were destroyed. Because we learn through stories. We learn through narrations. Um, and then humans are also attracted by stories. I mean, one of the things that some of the 
uh, Sahaba said to the Prophet, because the Jews had said, oh, we have stories in our book. You don't have, you know. And, and, and if you look at Surat Yusuf, Surat Yusuf came down. It's the only surah that is similar to the Bible in its narrative uh, form. And one of the reasons for that is to show people who criticize the Qur'an for not being like other books that if Allah wanted to, He's already done that. If He wanted to make it like the Bible, He would have just revised the Bible. But this is a new message. And it's for the last people. And so it has all of the elements that are, that are useful to the last people uh, in it. And, uh, and then finally, I'm going to quickly go uh, over, and I'll end here, um, that... The Ibn Juzay identifies 12 sciences. The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever speaks about the Qur'an from his opinion is wrong even if he's right. And one of the things that the ulama traditionally were uh, terrified of doing was uh, commenting on what the Qur'an means. Because you're arrogating to yourself an understanding of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to his creation, which is incredibly dangerous thing to do. But many of the ulama understood that hadith to mean if you did not have the adawat, the tools of understanding the Qur'an, then you shouldn't speak about the Qur'an. There's, there's 12 that he identifies. The first is tafsir itself. That you know that the tafsir, there's a difference between tafsir and ta'wil. Some of the ulama say that they're the same, and others say the tafsir is the outward meaning of the, the actual mebna. So you have like... Uh, you know, uh, inna is a, is a type of, uh, you know, a, a tool in the Arabic language that, that's used for emphasis, all right? It's for tawkid. And so that's, you understand what that means, the tafsir. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, innaka lamin al mursaleen, you know that it's emphasizing that. And then the lamb there is also to even create a stronger emphasis. Or that it's, uh, you know, it's, you also know that it's uh, jawab qasam, Something like that. I mean, those are the tools that you need to understand. Uh, fasr in Arabic is, it just means kashf. It means to unveil something. To, and one of the things Imam Ali said about Ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhuma, is he said, يفسر القرآن كأنه ينظر إلى الغيب من وراء ستار رقيق. He interprets the Quran as if he's looking at the unseen through a gauze fabric. And that's how amazing Ibn Abbas's understanding of the Qur'an because the Prophet ﷺ made that dua for him. So, tafsir. And then the qira'at. You should know the qira'at. For instance, in, in Yasin it says, Tanzil al-Aziz al-Hakim, which is mansub. And then it says in Warsh, which was read tonight, Tanzil al-Aziz al-Hakim, which is marfu'ah. So if you don't know that there's more than one way to read that, because... In one, it could be mubtada, it could be khabar of uh, mubtada mahdhuf. In the other, it, it could be, um, you know, it could be mansub lil masdariya because it's saying anzalahu tanzilan or something like that. So it's mansub al masdar. There's different, if you don't know the qiraat, then you can make mistakes. And that's why you have to know qiraat or you'll go astray. In, in interpreting the Qur'an. And then you have to know the ahkam. So you have to know that there's rules in the Qur'an. There, there are verses that are abrogated. There's verses... Uh, and then naskh, which is abrogation. Like the Qur'an, you know, you don't put the woman in the house until she dies. Right? That's abrogated. So you have to know those things because there's verses in the Qur'an that don't have applicability. And then the hadith. Because if the Prophet said something about a verse and we're fortunate... And I say fortunate because the Prophet did this for our benefit. We are fortunate that the Prophet did not, he did it as a mercy to us in enabling the Qur'an to be interpreted in many, many different ways. Because had the Prophet said this is what the verse meant, nobody could ever dare say it meant anything else. And so the Prophet ﷺ, as a mercy to us, 
it's very limited what he actually spoke about the Qur'an. Now one could say, well, he would have solved all the problems. That's true. But it's for this honoring human beings and their intellect and giving them the ability to think for themselves and not have everything spelled out for them. It's a great blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's one of the blessings that the Prophet said. He said, Mawti khayru lakum. Right? Tuhdithuna fayuhdatha lakum. You know, my death is good for you. I mean, the greatest musibah of our ummah was his death. But he said, my death is good for you. Because you do things and rulings come down. If I stayed with you, those rulings would keep coming down until you couldn't do them all. So the fact that the revelation stopped was a blessing to people because it would have gotten too much. So, and then uh, Al-Qasas, knowing the stories of the prophets, like in Habib al-Najjar, in the... In the, in the uh, uh, the, the Surah Yasin, there's a story in there, so to know that story. Tasawwuf, which we could go on a long thing of what that means, but basically it's about taskiya, tasfiya, uh, purification of the heart, and then usul al din aqidah, usul al fiqh, which is understanding, especially language, like al amr yadullu ala al wujub adatan, that if a command comes in the Quran, it's for an obligation normally, sometimes it's not like kulu wa sharabu wa tusirifu, eat and drink but not to excess. It's not haram to eat every once in a while to have your full, but generally it's makru to do that. You know, so there's things like that, uh, even though that's a command. And then logha, logha al-arabiyya, to know the language, to know, uh, you know the marfu'at, the mansubat, the majrurat, to know the ishtiqaqat, to know the basic sarf, uh, of, of the, the Qur'an. And then uh, al-bayan, which is balagha, which is ma'ani, to know uh, badi'a, ilm al-badi'a, which is muhassinat al logha how the logha embellishes itself, uh, to know uh, the, the rhetorical devices, isti'ara, to know what majaz is, kinaya, uh, you know, these, these type things, tibaq, iltifat, uh, understanding those things. So these are all the tools um, and now there's people that think, oh, they can just talk about the Qur'an without having studied any of this stuff. And it's a disaster. Because, uh, you know, you can really get yourself into trouble. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, reward all of you and um, reward, inshallah, the people that uh, have been behind this uh, Medina Institute. Uh, and inshallah, uh, I hope you have a blessed time uh, during you know, these lessons. Uh, really good people that we have here. So, subhanakallahum wa bihamdika ashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruk wa atubu ilayk. Alhamdulillah. Allahum wafaq al-Islam wal-Muslimin. Allahum wafaqna fi islamina ya arham al-Rahimin. Allahum asadad khutana la ilaha illa anta subhanak. Allahum hawan alayna fi hadhi al-ayyam. المصائب التي نزلت في تكسيس اللهم لا ترد علينا ردودا سيئة على المسلمين في أمريكا وفي غيرها يا رحم الراحمين سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون والسلام على المسلمين والحمد لله رب العالمين Before we start, I just 
I want to do a few. La ilaha illallah and then pray on the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Astaghfirullah, 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 astaghfirullah. إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعاله وصحبه وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعاله وصحبه وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما فاعلم أنه لا إله إلا الله 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 أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا محمد عبده ورسوله سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون والسلام على المسلمين الحمد لله رب العالمين. The um, the علماء traditionally uh, started the uh, any science with ten, what they called al mabadi al ashara. Did did anybody do that? Any teachers before? Did anybody do that in in this program? Okay. Um, every every science has what are called al mabadi al ashara, and the these are like al mabda in Arabic is a pl a beginning place. It's it's the uh, it's the place where you begin something. So it's it's a foundation. It's a, it's a, it's something that everything else starts from or emanates from, and so they considered that there were ten foundations that you should know before you actually started in on something. Uh, and there are many versifications of these things, but probably one of the most famous is Inna al Mabadi al Kulli Fan al Ashara al Haddu wa al Mawdu'u thumm al Thamra. Every Science, fen, and the Ar the Arabs traditionally called a branch of knowledge a fen, um, the art of. Like we, we talk about the art of poetry or the art of this or the art of medicine. So it's very similar to that idea. Uh, the fen is is the art of something. So everything had these. Um, every art has ten mabadi or beginning points. Al-Haddu is the definition of a thing. And so the definition of something is getting to the es essence of it. And one of the things about modern people is that they don't really know hudud anymore. Like in, in Arabic, tilka hudud Allah, fara ta'taduha. These are the limits that God has sent. And so don't transgress the limits. The, the limits of language are the definitions, that the had that you use. It's very important when we speak that we, we understand the words that are being used. One of the great problems in, in human societies is the breakdown of communication. If I use a word like freedom, what is the definition of freedom? Americans are always talking about freedom. What is freedom? Hurriya, because in, in Arabic, freedom is very different from the definition of freedom in this culture. Uh, for instance, freedom in, 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 in the pre-Islamic 
culture, the hur was in contradistinction to the slave. So a free person was somebody who, who was not an abd. The hur and the abd. Now, one of the interesting things about Islam is it makes you Abdullah. Now, if you're Abdullah, what does that mean in the relationship to everything else? You're free. Because the ubudiyah is only to Allah. It's not to anything else. And so, the hur, the Arab uh, poet says, al hurru abdun ma tamah that the the free man is a slave as long as he's covetous as long as he's greedy as long as he wants wal abdu hurrun ma tamah and the slave is a free man if he's content which gets to the essence of the arab understanding of freedom before islam that freedom is moral freedom it's freedom from want not freedom to. In our culture, freedom has almost in, been entirely defined by freedom to. Now I'm using this just as an example because I could give a whole talk just on freedom and the different ideas about freedom, but I'm only using that as a segue into the idea that when terms are not defined, miscommunication arises. So if you're talking about aggression, to me, and your understanding of aggression is my understanding for terrorism, we don't have a dialogue. <laughs> so you're saying I'm an aggressor and I'm saying you're a terrorist for, I mean, this is like the Arabs who say, one of the Jahali Arabs was asked, you know, what is oppression? What is the definition of injustice? And he said, when my neighbor comes and takes my goats and my camels and my women because they had razaya, they had you know the the ghuzat, the Arabs and Jahadi Arab they used to go and attack the other people and he said well wh so what's what's justice and he said when I go take his goats and his camels and his <laughs> women <laughs> so the Arabs also say, Ba'ukum tajurru wa ba'ila tajur. You know, your, your preposition works in the sentence, but you're not granting my preposition the same agency. I mean, that's a grammarian's way of saying the same thing. So, I, a Yemeni told me, he said, the whole problem with America, he said, it's like the, the, the wolf that came down and the sheep was drinking from the pond, and he said, he said, I'm going to eat you. And he said, why? And he said, You know, you, you got the water all muddy. And the sheep said, when? He said, last year. <laughs> and the sheep said, I wasn't born last year. <laughs> and the wolf said, well, your father did it. <laughs> so... So we don't have communication, so you have to identify things. Now the word had means limit. Mahdud means limited. Like Imam uh, Tahawi says about God, la hududa. God has no had, has no limit. He's, he's limitless, without limit. So a definition defines something and gives you, and it's done through what they call tard wa aks. It's done through exhausting the possibilities. So. When you describe, if you give a definition of a human being, the, the, uh, the logicians define the human being in the Arabic tradition as al hayawan al natiq. Right? This is the al hayawan al natiq, the speaking animal. That we're animal, we have, we're hayawan, but we're not like other animals because we're rational. We can speak, we can articulate. That's why in Arabic, uh, logic is called mantiq, which is. The, the tool by which you speak. So the nataq is the one that can speak and make arguments and set up uh, arguments. That is the definition of a human being. And then you have descriptions of human beings. A lot of people confuse descriptions with definitions. So when we look at the definition of tafsir, haddu tafsir, what is tafsir? 
in, in order to get to a definition, you have to look, first of all, the Arabs, uh, the, you know, the scholars of, of this tradition always say, you have to explain the term. You have to know the definition of the term itself. The term tafsir comes from al-fasr, which is kashf, to unveil or to, to remove a veil from something, to remove something so that you can see it. Kashafna an kal ghita. We have removed the ghita from, from your eyes. We've removed the ghita. People have a ghita. They have this veil over their eyes. Allah says that he removes that veil on yom al-qiyamah. And then, فَبَصُرُكَ الْيَوْمَ hadid. Today, your eyes are like hadid, piercing, eagle eyes. So, the, 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 the word, and when you get into علم الاشتقاق, which is a very interesting knowledge in Arabic, which is the science of word derivations and the fact that words that share letters have similar meanings. And this is throughout Arabic, which is one of the miracles of Arabic and a proof that the, the language is tawqifiya, that no human beings could have worked this out to, to put, because words share a letter like ilm, amal, and lama. You know, if you, if you just switch the, the words around ilm and then put amal and then lama, those are the three that come out of that. So ilm is knowledge, amal is action, action is based on knowledge. And when people know something and act according to their knowledge, they become lama, brilliant. al ma'i is a brilliant scholar. So they're related. Now, fasar in Arabic is kashafna. Another related word is safar, to journey. What happens when you journey? Journeys are about discovery. Journeys are about unveiling. The Arabs say, yusfiru an damirihi. He's telling me what's inside. He's revealing his innermost thoughts to me. The Arabs say that the musafir is the one yusfiru an khuluqihi. He, a, a, a traveler will let you know his character because when people travel, their character gets unveiled. So this, the, the, uh, the tafsir is the science of unveiling the meanings of Qur'an. It's to reveal the meanings of Qur'an. That's the had. The... the, the uh, the mawdu' of the, the, the topic of the Qur'an, the next is the mawdu'. The topic of the Qur'an is kalam Allah. That's what it's about. The topic of the Qur'an is dealing with kalam Allah. And then its thamra, its benefit is ma'rifatu kalamillah tibqan lil You know, it's to understand the the knowledge of and, and as a way of drawing near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you, you understand that's the benefit that is derived from the science itself the benefit the benefit is to know when I read the Quran Yasin wal Quran al Hakim I know what Quran al Hakim means and the benefit of that is that I understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking to me now if I know we, when we get into the Masail, uh, I'll do that when I get there. But the, and then the next is wafadruhu. The fadl of the, of the Quran, wafadruhu, nisbatun wa wadi. The fadl is the, the, the virtue of the, the science itself. There's different sciences have different virtues. For instance, grammar is a beautiful science. It's one of the most important sciences because without it you can't understand classical languages. English is, is not a grammatical language. It has a grammar. It has a grammar, but it's not a grammatical language in that you do not need to know its grammar to understand it. It's very easy to learn Arabic, uh, to learn English and communicate in English and you're gonna have miscommunications but you can understand it without knowing because it's not an inflected language. So if I say akada musa kusa in Arabic, I, I have to understand musa is a person and kusa is a food. Because the, the, the inflection of that sentence, it could be the, the, the zucchini ate Moses. 
that could be the meaning if 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 Kusa is marfu' and Musa is mansub. But I don't know that because the harakat don't show up. That's the way English is. So there's there's room for ambiguity in English in, in terms, but English follows a syntax. English doesn't let you say the cucumber ate Musa and it means Musa ate the cucumber. In Arabic you can say the cucumber ate Musa, but you can mean Musa ate the cucumber. Do you see the difference? Because the syntax in Arabic, the structure of the language is, is very flexible. You can put the verb at the end. You can put the verb at the beginning. You can put the verb in the middle. In English, you put it in the beginning or the middle. In, in, uh, in German, you put it at the end. There's a Jewish theory that that's why they were able to do what they were doing because they don't think about the action until the end of their sentence. <laughs> So language is, is, there's a lot of problems that happen in communication. Now, the, if you look at knowing I'rab, you have to know grammar. Arabs, modern Arabs, they can read a newspaper, but if you forced most modern Arabs to read it with uh, the ashkal, they'd be all over the place. In fact, the Arabs say, Al-Hanu min qari. He's making more mistakes than somebody reciting from a book meaning that it's, it's very easy to make mistakes in Arabic. I mean, even uh, ulama who really know Arabic very well make grammatical mistakes sometimes, really. It just happens. And uh, it's rare, one of the few people I ever saw that I've never heard him make a mistake grammatically was uh, Sheikh Mustafa al-Makki. He was an Egyptian, Azhari, that I used to go listen to him go do commentary on the hadith. And it was just... People used to go just to hear him talk. There were people there that really weren't even interested in the lecture, I think. They were just like, it's amazing. You know, just the way he talks. <laughs> Allah yarhamu. Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayah is like that also. So there, there are Sheikh Sa'id Ramadan al -Bulti. I mean, these, these people are like maraja in Arabic, if you listen to them. Um, and they're, they've spent, but still, you get into these books and you will find that, that they can misunderstand things. Many times Arabs know that when you read a sentence, sometimes you have to go back to the beginning because you worked out that, oh, what you thought was actually the subject was the object. So you get back and you have to go back and read it again. So it's a grammatical language in that it doesn't allow you to understand it without having either intuitive knowledge of grammar, which is how the pre-Islamic the, uh, pre Arabs had it and the early Arab Muslims, or to uh, later on. Uh, to learn it. And that's the way we have to do it now. You have to learn grammar to be able to read it uh, properly. And so that the fadl of Arabic is that it, grammar has fadl. My point was grammar has a great virtue, but it's low on the, on, in, in, in the Islamic sciences. It's the one you have to start with. Like one of the little phrases I learned early on was uh, you know this is like tartib of knowledge the, the most important knowledge is to learn your aqidah and then to learn like the practical things to do in your religion to work on purifying your heart and then and then a, a tool that you have to begin with, which is Arabic grammar. So even though it's, it's the least of the sciences, all of them are based on it. al arabiyatu miftah al-ulum. al arabiyatu miftah al-ulum. It is the key to knowledge in our religion. If you don't know Arabic, you, you do not have access to knowledge in the same way that somebody, there's secondary sources and you meet people that are very learned about Islam. So you can't, you can't say that somebody can't understand Islam without understanding Arabic. I don't believe that. But to get into the sciences of Islam, you have to learn Arabic. And certainly these primary sources, because they'll, they'll be until the end of time in Arabic. The Quran cannot be translated. It can't. And, and in reality, no real great literature can be translated. It just doesn't work. You, anybody who knows two languages and, and had, has read a piece of great literature in both languages, they know the original is always better, if they really know it. it because you can't, and language is too nuanced. 
So that is, and then nisbatun, the nisba is what the science is related to. Like tib is nisbatuhu ila al-ulum allati tata'anuqu bi siha wa marad al-badan. It's a science that's related to the health and disease of a body. That's, that's the relationship. Tafsir nisbatuhu ila ulum al-shari'iyya. It is in fact afdaluha wa a'laha. It's the highest and most exalted of all the sciences of sharia. So this is its relationship to other sciences is that. And then al-wadi' is the one who first formulated the science. It's important to know that because those people have fadl. They have virtue and so in classically, the scholars always honored the one who came with the science first. Like Imam al-Shafi'i was honored by being the founder of usul al-fiqh. That does not mean that the ulama weren't using usul before Shafi'i, they were. He was the one that saw what they were doing and articulated the methodology and theory. Nobody had done that before him. In the same way that Aristotle is the inventor of logic, but he wasn't the first person to ever use logic. People were using logic Plato and Socrates are filled with Aristotle. In fact, Aristotle uses most of his examples from Plato and Socrates. But he was the one that identified what they were doing, the formula. So tafsir has been going on for, from the very beginning. The Prophet was explaining the Quran. The ulama differ on who really is wadi at tafsir. Most of them say, al-rasikhun fil ilm. They're the ones Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the Qur'an that it has two types of ayahs, the clear ayahs and the hazy ayahs. And then it says, you know, that the people who have diseases in their heart follow the hazy ayahs, which is always a sign that somebody's not well. If, if they ask you what certain verses mean and they're hazy verses, it's always a sign that something's going on. But he, Allah says, وَالرَّاسِخُونَ فِي الْعِلْمِ يَقُولُونَ آمَنَّا you know, the people firmly rooted in knowledge. And it says, Nobody knows the ta'wil except Allah of these hazy verses. Some of the ulama say the wow there is called atf. It's a conjunction. And so it's actually saying Allah knows them and the rasikhun fil ilm. And then stop. And others say no, the wow is actually isti'naf. The sentence stops at لا يعلم تأويلها إلا الله that only Allah knows the ta'wil and the rasikhun fil ilm say about that we accept it it's all from Allah so so there's a difference of that wow in tafsir but Imam Imam uh, Ibn Abbas رضي الله عنه said وأنا من الراسخين you know the, he actually said I'm from amongst the rasikhin who know the ta'wil of the Qur'an because the Prophet ﷺ said, Allahumma faqihu fi al-deen wa'allimhu ta'wila. You know, faqihu fi al-Qur'an wa'allimhu ta'wila. Teach him the Qur'an, the meanings of Qur'an, and teach him how to do interpretation of the Qur'an. So he was from those people. So this is a khilaf that's been going on for a long time. Wa kullu nasan awham al-tashbiha, awwilhu, awfawud, warum tanziha. You know, there's ulama that say you can interpret everything in the Quran and then there's other ones that say except even the huruf and muqatta'at they, they have meanings that they say relate to those words and they say that it's open as long as you have the adawat if you have the tools of knowledge right then you can uh, you can make that tafsir or ta'wil if you don't you can't so Ibn Abbas is also some say that he is the the first real mufassir of the Quran, Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. And if Ibn Abbas said something, it has a lot of authority amongst the ulama just because of who he is. And then the important thing is to determine, did he actually say it? Is the sentence sound or not? But generally, Ibn Abbas is, is after the Prophet sallallahu If Ibn Abbas says something about the Quran, he has a position amongst the ulama and the mufassirun that is, is uh, is is uh, is a very high, and then uh, al ism al ism is ilm tafsir, and it's also ta'wil, right? Uh, because tafsir and ta'wil have uh, synonymous meanings. Some of the ulama say no, that tafsir is what the words mean, like al Quran. It's from qara'a, 
and it's the root is jama to gather something, and it's the gathering of these words. Some say uh, that it's ghair uh, mushtaq, it's its own word. It just means al-Quran, it's the name, like Allah. Some say Allah is not from al-ilah, it's just Allah. That's the proper name of God, and, and Allahu alam what it means. So these are differences, but if you know the differences, then that's also a type of knowledge of the meaning of the actual articulation. Al-Hakim is from Hakama, which is to control something, to judge something, to be wise. Hikma is wisdom. Hukam is judgment. Hakam is a judge. So Al-Hakim is the one, and then it's, it's on a certain wazan that means fa'il and it means maf'ul. So it can be the thing that is, is judged or the thing that is... Uh, perfect, muhkam, you know, it's complete in its, there's a, there's a perfection to it, and it can also be the wise. So generally it's interpreted here as the wise Quran, a dhikr al-hakim, you know, that it's wise. So that is knowing the tafsir, if you know the meanings. But then the ta'wil is, those are the denotations. If you want to, to a, a word that's used in lexicology, a denotation is what the word specifically means. The connotation are the meanings that are possible that are derived from that basic meaning. So when I say, for instance, hand, in English, this is a hand. But I also say, lend me a hand. I don't mean cut off your hand and, and I can borrow it. Like, lend me a hand. I'm asking you for help. So a connotation of hand can be help. You can also say uh, his hand is more powerful than his hand. Now I'm talking about uh, power. Uh, you can say, I've got to hand it to him. Right? I mean, there's lots of ways that hand can be used. In, in Arabic, there's, you know, oh, there's literally, uh, there's about 17 meanings for hand. In, in Desht, which is Farsi, like Imam al-Ghazali said, about people that were translating Quran into Farsi, he said you should never translate Yadullah into Desht, Desht Khoda. Because he said if you say Desht in Arab, in Farsi, he said it doesn't mean the same things it means in, 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 uh, in Arabic, so you're delimiting the meaning, which he said is unjust to the Book of Allah. It's a problem with translation. Because Arabic meanings are very vast. So, that is, uh, the, the, you know, ta'wil and tafsir are the names, but it's usually ilm uh, al-tafsir is the name that's given for this science. And then al-istimdad, where does the science draw its knowledge from? Al-istimdad, yistamiddu from what? What does it draw its knowledge from? It draws its knowledge from the book, the sunnah, and then, فَطَحُّ Arab, فِي الْبَلَاغَ You know, the great Arabs of Jahaliya, Al-Arab Al-Arba, Al-Arab Al-Musta'riba, Qabla Al-Khadrama, it's the Arabs that really knew Arabic. So you can use classical Arabic to interpret the Qur'an. And one of the most foundational principles of Quranic interpretation is that it be in accordance with the Arabic language. If you make a tafsir that is not in accordance with the Arabic language, there's two things. Usually it's considered batil, but there are some of the ulama that allow for what's called ishara, right? Ishara, which is a meaning that has a truth to it, but it's not really specific to the, uh, to the actual language itself. But there's a truth to it. So for instance, attaqullah wa yu'allimukum Allah. Have taqwa of Allah and God will teach you. Many scholars have used that as a jumla sharqiyah, a conditional sentence. If you have taqwa, God will teach you. That's not what the Arabic says. So that's an ishara from the ayah. It's not a tafsir of the ayah. Do you see? Because the ayah actually says, Have taqwa of Allah and God will teach you what you need to have taqwa. That's actually the meaning of the Arabic in the way that it presents itself. But you can take an ishara like that, but isharas are very dangerous. And Imam al-Sulami wrote a book called Al-Haqaiq, which is a Sufi interpretation of the Quran. Some of the ulama said, it's not haqaiq, it's bawatil. 
Because haqaiq means realities, bawatil means falsehoods. So some of the ulama said it's bawatil. So this has been going on for a long time, as you can assess from that. What Imam Ibn Juzay al Kelbi says, Ida ansafna, if we're fair, fihi haqaiq wa bawatil. There's realities in it and there's also falsehoods. So tafsir can have ishara is a dangerous uh, thing. And some of the Sufis took completely outrageous meanings that are unacceptable. And some of them took isharat, uh, an example of that about like saramun uh, ala il yasin. Like in relation to yasin. Saramun ala il yasin. In Surah Safat, it says, peace be upon Ilyasin. Some of them say it means there's different qiraat. One of the qiraat is il yasin, and so they say it actually means ilyas because the the siyaq, the context of the verse, was talking about ilyas, and the other ayahs mention that peace be upon the prophet that it was talking about. So here it means ilyasin, but there's a qiraat sabiyah that says al yasin, the family of yasin. And some of them say ilyas was ilyas ibn yasin. And so it was actually the family of Yasin. Some of them say that Yasin means the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, that it means Ya Sayyid or Ya Insan, and it's addressing the Prophet, Innaka Yasin, Innaka. Surely you, Yasin, are from the messengers. So they say, Salaman ala ya al Yasin is pr prayers uh, that peace be upon the family of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. Some of them say Yasin is the name for Quran. And so, salamun ala al yasin, salamun ala al Quran. So these are these are interpretations. If you look, even one of the great Sufi commentators of the Quran, Ibn Ajiba, says about salamun ala al yasin. It says, asiyaqu yaba, hada ta'wil. The context really doesn't allow for this interpretation. But yet, Ibn Kathir, a very authoritative scholar of tafsir brings that as a tafsir of that verse, that it meant the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. So these are the ways that the scholars now have looked at this science. With tafsir you have what's called naql, and then you have aql. Naql and aql are the tradition and then reason. These are the two components in tafsir. Naql is what's handed down, and then aql is how you understand what's handed down. Some of the ulama say, really the only safe tafsir is naql. We should just say what the first three generations said and not really go beyond that. And other ones said that's uh, insane because the Quran is, is salihun li kulli zaman. It's appropriate for every time and place. And the reason that the Prophet ﷺ did not interpret it was for us to be able to derive meanings from it until the end of time. So the Quran is something where the, Ibn Omar was asked about tafsir and he said, Ahsunu tafsirihi az zaman. The best tafsir of the Quran is time itself. Just allow its meanings to unveil. Right. So, so the, and then the, uh, the hukma shari' is that it's fard kifaya. Hukma shari' is that it's fard kifaya. That you, you, somebody has to learn it amongst our community because the book always has to be understood. One of the problems in, in, our, in the modern Muslim world is that the Quran is memorized but the tafsir is not learned. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Antum fi zamanin qalilun qurra'uhu kathirun uh, uh, you're in a time when the people who recite the Quran are few, but the people who understand it are many. Uh, and he said, ala ummati zaman, kathirun qurra'uhu, qalilun fuqaha'uhu, yahfaduna hurufuhu wa yudayyuna hududahu. But a time will come on my community, O Kamaqal, a time will come on my community when there will be many Quran reciters, but few people who understand the Quran. They will master its letters, but they won't follow its injunctions. So the Prophet ﷺ warned about simply learning. It's, in, it's a good thing to, and I'm not, rote memorization is a beautiful thing, and it's one of the qualities of our ummah. 
but the Arabs say, to memorize two little lines is better than reading several pages. But to understand two little lines is better than memorizing several pages. So uh, that's an important aspect. And then Masa'idu are what, what is the Quran about? Well, the Quran tafsir, there are different tafsirs. The Masail of the Quran are the awamr wa nawahi, the injunctions, prohibitions, that's the fiqh of the Quran. And certain ulama deal with that. Those are called tafsirs of ahkam, like Imam al-Qurtabi. His tafsir deals largely with the ahkam of Quran. Qadi Abu Bakr ibn al-Arabi, his tafsir is called uh, ahkam al-Quran. It deals with the ahkam. He focuses on the verses that relate to uh, injunctions and prohibitions. And then you have tafsirs and al jassas from the Hanafi madhab. Then you have tafsirs that focus on the grammar of the Quran, i'rab al Quran. So there's a whole slew of Qurans that deal with that. Um, then you have Qurans that deal with the balagha of Quran, like al Kashaf, which is one of the favorite traditionally uh, Qurans of uh, tafsirs of the ulama, which was written by Imam Zamakhshari, the Mu'tazidi scholar. It's a, it's a brilliant tafsir, but it deals largely with the rhetorical nature of the Qur'an. Uh, Baqallani also wrote on that, I'jaz al-Qur'an, from the, uh, that aspect of it. Uh, rifai and other ones. And then you have the uh, tafsirs that are naqal, ma'thur. They're tafsirs that relate all the hadiths, like Ibn Kathir is focused on naqal. And then you have tafsirs that are related to uh, the, the vastness of the Qur'an, like Imam al-Razi, Fakhruddin al-Razi. Some of the ulama, and you know, it's like a hasad, but some of the ulama sa said about his tafsir, Mafatih al-Ghayb, fihi kullu shay'an illa tafsir. There's everything in it except tafsir. Like my talk. Because people are saying, when's he going to get to Yasin? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Yasin's not easy. Yeah, because tafsir scares me. <laughs> I don't like tafsir because it's a heavy thing. It's a weighty thing. Sanulqi alayka qawlan thaqila. We're going to thrust on you a weighty word. The Quran used it when the Prophet had the Quran come down the camel, Abu Bakr had his leg under the Prophet's thigh and he thought his leg was going to break from the weight of the Prophet's thigh when the, the wahi was coming down. But the camel couldn't ever hold him. If the Quran came down when he was on the camel, and one of the amazing things is that the Quran has been revealed in all these different places, like Fisama on, on Al-Isra, Fil Ard, and Baina Sama'i wal Ard when he was on the camel. I mean, they, they use these examples that the Qur'an was revealed in all these different situations. Even in, in, in his bedroom, when he was with Aisha, it's one, he said she was the only woman that the Qur'an was revealed like that to him. So, the, uh, but Fakhr al-Din deals with philosophy, he deals with amazing meanings of the Qur'an and goes into that. So, these are all the types of things. And then you have... Uh, uh, Tafsir Ishari, which are the, the Sufi tafsirs. And there's no doubt anybody who's fair, with the, some of them are fascinating. They're very interesting to read because they, they, uh, you just marvel at how they get these meanings out of the, the verses. Imam al-Qushayri's tafsir is beautiful and it's generally a very accepted tafsir. Um, and Ibn Ajiba has some amazing insights into the Quran and he's quite, because he was such a vast scholar, of the outward sciences, he's very, he'll tell you when he thinks this, it's, they're off on this one. Um, so these are all the different uh, variations uh, of the Quran. So now uh, we'll begin. That, so that's what, uh, you know, I just wanted to give you, uh, you know, to, to the, that's what the first lecture was giving you a, 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 a definition of the Quran, da'wat al-khalq ila ibadatillahi, right? Is, is the invitation of God to this uh, uh, 
worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to enter into this deen uh, with him. And then I went through uh, the, what's that's based on, the aqaid and the ahkam, based on the understanding and then the actions that relate to that understanding. And then based on the seven uh, subject matter of the Quran, of every verse is one of those or more of those seven meanings about the rububiyat, right? Uluhiyat, the rububiyat, the nubuwat, the ma'ad, the ahkam, right? What else? Wa'ad and wa'id and the qasas. So those are the, those are the real uh, foundation. And then this one was to let you know just what these ten things are about this science. And now Surah Yasin is, Surah in Arabic is, is a, it can mean a fence or something, an enclosure. So it's something that's enclosed uh, in something. And the, the surat, it's also yujma uh, ala suwar and surat, uh, but it's an enclosure. Yusawirahu aswira, the women know, they wear the siwar, right? And the siwar is from the same root. So the siwar is something that encompasses your wrist. So the surah is something that encompasses, in this it's like a chapter what we would call in English a chapter, but it's, it's an encompassing theme. And one of the very profound aspects of the Quran that's, that's, that's quite stunning when you get into it, and very few scholars have done it. Uh, Ibn Zubair al-Gharanati is one of them. I mean, Sheikh Muhammad Ghazali wrote a book recently before he died, Allah Rahmahu, called The Themes of the Quran. And uh, in, in the introduction, I, I don't, I don't know why they did this, but they said like he was the first scholar to do that. So whoever wrote that introduction hasn't read tafsir, because there were a lot of scholars that have done that. Um, but they're not as many as one would think. But the famous ones, Imam Siyuti uh, wrote a tafsir on the themes of Quran, Ibn Zubair al-Gharanati, but probably the best is al-Biqa'i, whose uh, tanasib al-ayat is amazing when he shows how verses and suwar are related to each other. But most of the ulama did a tafsir that just went from ayah to ayah, and they didn't create the themes of the Quran, which is problematic. Partly they did it to leave that to people. You know, once you understand it, you need to study the book. If they did it all for you, then you're just passive recipients, right? You have to think. Islam is about thinking and yatadarasunuhu bainahum, they study it together. Um, so the, the Yasin, which is the 36th uh, chapter of the Quran, is named Ibn Abbas, oddly enough, I mean the Muqatta'at, I think maybe somebody, did anybody talk about the Muqatta'at before the, the, the Huruf of the Quran? The Huruf of the Quran are not known. I mean the soundest thing of the Huruf is Allahu A'lam. Allah knows what they mean. But Yasin, of all of them, Yasin is the one that most of the ulama actually do interpret. The other ones, they tend to say, I mean, some say Alif Lam Mim, Alif is for Allah, Lam is for Jibreel, Mim is for Muhammad, and that's Allah to Jibreel to Muhammad. I mean, you get these types of uh, tafsir that they, they say, but generally we don't know. Taha, you know. Alif Lam Ra, Allahu A'lam. But I would say one of the most in intriguing for me aspects of the Muqta'at is it's almost like Allah is saying, before you even think about reading this book, set aside what you think you know. Because if you come to this book with arrogance, there's nothing in this book for you. Like the, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the student who came to the sheikh and he was saying, I studied with so-and-so, th these hadiths, and I studied with so-and-so, this book, and I studied with so-and-so, this book, and I studied with so-and-so, this book. And he was going on and on and on. The sheikh was saying, so, so what do you want to do? He said, I want to study with you. And so the sheikh started pouring the tea, and then when it, the glass got full, it just kept fulling, you know, going over. And the student said, stop, it's full. He said, why? And he said, because it can't take any more. <laughs> and he said, so a full cup can't take any more. He said, right. He said, well, you seem like a full cup. You know, what, what, <laughs> you know, what are you coming to me to learn <laughs> for? So the, uh, you know, the Arif Lamim is, 
have some humility when you come to this book. Now, another aspect is Saucer, for people who know uh, linguistics or people who study linguistics, Saucer, who was a famous linguist uh, about 100 years ago, developed a theory of language, uh, which is where we get structuralism from. Structuralism, the idea that languages have these deep structures and uh, he, he identifies language as being related to differences, that language is not about definition so much as it is about the differences of things in relation to other things. So there's these structures, and if you work out the semantic patterns, you can understand language. One of the things Saucer says, though, is the phoneme is meaningless. That's a principle in structuralism, that all of language begins with doubled phonemes. You need a dyad to begin, like of, of, you need those two sounds. Ah, uh, doesn't really mean anything. <laughs> doesn't mean anything. That was Saucer's theory. This negates that theory because it's meaning all the way down. Even the letters have meanings. We just don't know what they mean. Everything is meaningful. Nothing is without meaning. These letters, letters are amazing. And, and the Arabic letters are amazing. Ain is an amazing letter. You know, Ain. I mean, just have you have to say it, Ain. You know, and it's like squeezing your, what, and Ain means essence. You know, it's the essence of something. It means the I, right? That's an amazing thing. Look at Lam. Lam is an amazing letter. Lam. L you know, have you ever seen babies when they, they put their tongue, mothers know this, they always put their tongue, newborns, you know how they put their tongue on the top of their mouth? Uh, and they do that. <coughs> do, you, do you know how they do that? Have, uh, am I making this up? They do all do it. All babies do that. That's the beginning of la ilaha illallah. Because that was what we were created to say. And so they're learning how to use that tongue to say the lamb letter. You know what lulan means in Greek? Lulan? It means to soothe. Because the most soothing sound to the Greeks was la, la, la. Which is why we say lullabies. La ilaha illallah. Why is that? Why is that recognized even by the ancient Greeks? That that sound, la, 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 la. You have to teach no, no, it's not la, la, it's la, ilaha, illallah. <laughs> it, it's much nicer. It has meaning, and it'll soothe your heart. Really, it's amazing. So these are amazing things. Ra is an amazing letter. I love ra. And the Arabs call it harfu takrir, which is the, the letter that does rrr. That's what takrir means. But then they say, but it's named that so that you don't do rrr, right? So Moroccans, when they recite Quran, they always do the rrr. But if you go to the east, they, they don't do that, right? But the, the ra sound, if you look at Arabic, rrr letters usually relate to pulling something along, like marra, farra, karra, right? It's amazing to, because the rrr, Right, marra, marra, that keeps happening over and over again. Karra, to flee, farra, to flee, karra, to go back. So it has the idea of something being dragged. Yajurru, jarra, to drag, literally. That's what jarra means. And then lam and ra are related. They're from the same makhraj. Say la. Now say ra. Right? Do you feel the articulation? That's called a makhraj. Ra. La, right? And that's why ra and la are often interchangeable in the Arabic language, in words. You can actually interchange lam and ra in words and you'll get the same meaning. It's amazing. So the, um, the huruf and muqatta'at are these secrets that Allah doesn't tell us what they mean, but we know they have meaning. So we say Allahu A'lam. But Yasin, if you take the word insan, and you turn it into a diminutive, which is called a tasghir in grammar. Uh, a diminutive is, is like uh, pepito in Spanish, right? Pepito, little pep, pepe, right? 
So uh, it, we don't, in English, you know, we don't really, we say little, pepe. We don't say pepito. So our diminutives aren't very sophisticated. But in Arabic, you have diminutives where you can say insan, and if you want to say little man, you say unaisin. Unaisin. And ya yeah means o. Oh. And then the Arabs like to do this thing which they call hadf, which is to cut things out that they don't, they just sound long or, so unaisin is too long to say little man. So they just say seen to mean little man or big man because tasghir is used for ta'zim also. So it's a nice thing about Arabic. The Arabs have wonderful strategies for insulting people and then when the person gets insulted they can always switch and say, I didn't mean that. <laughs> it's really interesting. There's so many devices in the Arabic language to do that and one of them is tasghir because you can call a man tasghir for tahqir to like belittle him but you can also call it to exalt him because it's a term of endearment. Oh my little one. And it's an in term, a term of, so you can, if you call a man, you little man, and he's, what? How dare you call me little? No, 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 I meant that. You're a, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> uh. So that's what Ibn Abbas said that that meant. Some, and he said it was in Lughat Tayy and in a riwayah in Syriania that it meant little, that it meant man in Syriania, seen. So Yasin is how it begins. Now, some say that, you know, generally there's a, what they call idhar. You have idgham and idhar in tajweed. Uh, idgham is when you assimilate a word into another word, like with the huruf al idgham, yarmalun. So you say, sirajan wa haja. That's idgham. Some say that the scene gets assimilated into the following wow. And others say that it's idhar, which would be unusual because the noon is a letter of assimilation. But there are points in that. Kalla bal rana ala qulubihim is an example of lam, which is, would normally have an idgham there. It has idhar in that surah. Um, but in warsh, you don't. There's idgham. So you say kalla bal rana ala qulubihim in, in warsh, riwayat warsh. There's idgham. In the other, there's idhar. So some of them say it goes yasin wal Quran, like that, into that. And others say, no, you stop on Yasin and do that. And then it has the, the med on both of those letters. So it begins with that opening. And then it begins with an oath. And this is one of the things about the huruf al uh, is that they are always dealing with the Quran. So if you look at the, the it, it's always followed by some expression of the Quran. One of the things that happened to the, the Prophet him, when revelation came to him, it was like a bell. Now a bell is reverberation. It's dawi, dawi. If you look at the word kun, and I learned this from a great musician, but I thought it was a very interesting, uh, he was a f uh, famous oud player from uh, Nubia, Hamza Alauddin. Because he said Allah began existence with kun, and he said that the ka is a cutting sound, which is true, it's used for cutting. In fact, in Arabic, many words that have cuts or relate to cutting. And in English, we even use cutting to cut. So ka is a cutting sound. And then noon is a vibratory sound. Kun. And so he was saying that the silence, you know, from, from that existence comes from nothingness into being. So it's literally cutting the nothingness. And then the noon is the reverberation of existence. And one of the things that we know about existence is it's all reverberating. Like physicists tell us everything has a resonance. Everything is resonating. And so resonance is, is dawi in Arabic, dawi. And the Quran, they talk about the Quran resonating. That the Sahaba kanu yaqra'unuhu ka dawi al nahl Like the reverberation of the, the, uh, the, uh, the bees. And one of the things about reciting Quran with tajweed is that you're forced to do these sounds that you normally don't do, which creates these resonances and affects you because these things have an effect on you. When you recite the Quran properly, you, it's forcing you to, your whole body begins to resonate. Yasin. It's, it's there, the sound itself is power. The sound is power. 
There's power in the sound itself. And, and so it's followed by this oath. The wow there is, is for qasam, to swear an oath. Wal Quran al Hakim. By the Quran, the wise Quran. Wal Quran al Hakim. And that's why it's Quran al Hakim with the kasra because of the wow. Wal Quran al Hakim. Innaka la min al mursaleen. Indeed, verily, you are one of those who have been sent. Why? Why the oath? One of the interesting things about when you, when you say something, that a proposition, somebody will say, bring your proof. What lawyers always do if they're good is they always establish their proofs before the proposition. So they give you all the reasons and then they have their summation which is to tell you why. Because they want you to rationally come to the conclusion and then they'll add stories in there to get the emotional content as well because they know that emotion's important. But they will give you the rational and then they bring you the proposition. Now, you have to understand an oath because one of the things about modern people is they don't know the power of words anymore. I'll give you an example. In this country, it, 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 does it, who knows Alexander Hamilton? First time probably ever mentioned in a discussion of the Quran. But Alexander Hamilton uh, was the Secretary of Treasury under Washington, right? How did he die? In a duel with a man called Aaron Burr, who had been vice president. Isn't it interesting that we had a vice president in this country who killed the Secretary of Treasury in a duel? <laughs> I mean, America, the beautiful. It's amazing. I mean, could you imagine them doing that now? Maybe they should. <laughs> Solve some of the problems in Washington. You know, I challenge you to a duel. I demand satisfaction. You know, Glenn Beck, I'd like to challenge him to a duel. I mean, these people have to know that words have meaning. That you can't just say things and not think that there's no meaning attached to those things. When you disparage the honor of people, when you vilify human beings that you have no knowledge of and you say things about them and who they are and, and what evil they've done, they've had no trial like Imam Luqman in, in, uh, in Detroit. What trial was he given? He's condemned. There's a jury, and a judge, and an executioner. Really? Nobody, there's no uproar about that. Because he's a poor man. He's an insignificant man. He's in an inner city, in the worst part of America, that looks like a war zone. And people don't care about people like that. So they can go in and just gun a man down who was a Navy SEAL, served his country. And, and, and what's the charge? Fencing stolen goods? This is how you deal with people that sell stolen, but they didn't even steal the property. This is how you deal with people that fence stolen goods. You raid their, their, their place of worship and, and let a dog out on the person and then gun them down when they shoot the dog in self-defense. But who cares, right? It's like these people in Cleveland it's like these women in Cleveland. Who cares? 14 women, convicted rapist, sex offender. But who cares? They're just poor people, right? Who cares? Even though people were complaining about the smell coming out, calling the police for months. No, words have meaning. If somebody calls for help, you should help them. There's actually haqal in qad in Islam, that people have a right to be saved, no matter who they are whether they're Jews, Christians, Hindus, Buddhists, it doesn't matter. Words have meaning. People disparage people's honor all the time. There was a time when people would actually demand satisfaction because honor meant so much to them. What did the founding fathers write when they wrote there? We upon this we pledge our lives, wealth, and sacred honor. Sacred honor. Honor in Arabic is shahama. 
It's very similar to the English meaning of honor, an honorable person. He's an honorable person, a man of his word, a woman of her word. That's what words are about. And that's why we don't even understand os anymore. Os, there's books in our tradition written on how to get out of os. That's how important people... Now we just say, wallahi, 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 wallahi. And nobody thinks about what wallahi means. You know, wallahi is used... It's unbelievable how people use wallahi now. It doesn't it has no meaning. Wallahi, akhi, ana qutra. Wallahi, ana. Why, why are you swearing an oath? It's a big thing to swear an oath. I used to tell Arabs I was born in a town called Walla Walla, which is true, and they would say, Walla Walla. <laughs> so I'm Walawi, <laughs> the man from Walla Walla. So people don't understand Os anymore. And that's why, you know, Herodotus, the great Greek historian, said, of all nations, no one takes the oath more seriously than the Arabs. This was centuries before Islam. Of all nations, no one takes the oath more seriously than the Arabs. If an Arab gives you his word, you know, my, my father said when he was young, he remembered a saying, you know, he's, he's like, in his 80s, but he said when he was young, he remembered a saying, I'd rather have an Arab on his word than uh, a contract. That was, that was a saying that people had about Arabs, like Arabs were people of their word. And that's why to swear an oath is not an insignificant thing. When Allah says, well, Quran al-Hakim, to the Arabs, this was a big thing. To swear an oath? that you are a messenger of God, innaka lamin al mursaleen. There, it's the answer to that oath. You are, surely, verily, now you have tawkeed. Because he could have said, wal Quran al-Hakim, anta rasul, anta mursal. No, innaka, verily, indeed, surely, and emphasis. And then la again, to use it again. That you are lamin al mursaleen. This is, I mean, we don't understand modern people. It's sad that we've lost this access. But this, when the Arabs first heard this, even the Jahli Arabs would be, it's power. It's power. It's, it's, it's power. It's inna kalamin al mursaleen. You know, this is real. This is not a lie. And who was Al Amin? The man who didn't tell lies. The man who didn't need to swear an oath because everybody believed him without an oath. So what does it mean when he swears an oath? And what does it mean when he's telling you his Lord is swearing an oath on his behalf? Yasin. Wal Quran al Hakim. Innaka la min al mursaleen. Ala sirat al mustaqim. On a straight path. You're not on a crooked path. This is a straight path. You're on a straight path. This is the path of istiqama. This is the way of uprightness. You're commanding to honesty. You're commanding to taking care of the poor. You're commanding to treating women with dignity. You're commanding to take care of the widow and the orphan. You're commanding to purify people from arrogance, from envy, from hatred. You're commanding people to join the bonds of kinship. You're commanding people to treat animals with dignity. You're commanding people to fight wars with, with rules of engagement. You're on a straight path. There's no crookedness in your path. And the people that are against this path that you're calling to are crooked people. That's what this is about. Ala sirat al mustaqim, tanzilul aziz al rahim. This is a tanzil. And this is mansub and marfu' according to the different qara'at. I'm doing warsh where he has it uh, marfu'. Some say it's mubtada. Tanzil al-aziz al-rahim. Litundira is the khabar. And some say that it's a khabar and then the mubtada is mahdu. For people that are interested in, in why there's differences of these uh, rafa'a, I'm not going to explain that. Um, tanzil al-aziz al-rahim is 
the tanzil is the bringing down of this book that nazala tanzilan so it's a masdar nuzila tanzilan or nazala nazala inna anzalna anzala nazala they're, they they have slightly different meanings in Arabic, whether it's inzal or tanzil or nuzul, um, but they all mean coming down. Nuzil, tanzilul aziz al rahim. The aziz, one of the things that Fakhruddin al Razi said that if you want to understand the Quran, the secret of the Quran is in the divine names. And that's a man who spent his entire life thinking about the Qur'an. And it's quite extraordinary why Allah uses... For instance, Al-Aziz Al-Rahim is unusual because usually it's what? Al-Aziz Al-Hakim. Like one of the punishments for the As-Sariq wa Sariq wa Aidihuma. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ends that verse with Al-Aziz Al-Hakim. Because Azza Fahakama, you know, Allah is Aziz, He has made property sacred. If you break the sacred trust of property, He has a hukum, and the hukum is severe. That's why when a Bedouin heard Asma'i recite the verse, and, and Asma'i said, Innaka Ghafur Rahim, the Bedouin said, Hada Kalam Man, who said that? And, and Al Asma'i said, Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, He said, La Wallah. He was Bedouin, didn't know anything about Quran. He said, Allah didn't say that. And al Asma'i said, thought about the verse and realized he'd made a mistake, and then said, Aziz al Hakim, and, he's, and the Bedouin said, Hada karamullah. That's the, the, he said, Azza fa hakama. You know, but you don't cut off hands and then say you're merciful and compassionate. <laughs> it's a different tajelli. So it's very interesting that here there's a tajelli of Izza and of Rahma. Because the Qur'an is Bushra and Indar. He's Bashir and Nadir. There's the Aziz in telling us he's Dhu Intiqam, and then there's the Rahim in telling us that he's going to forgive us if we turn to him. So the Qur this is Tanzilul Aziz al Rahim. It has Izza and it has Rahma. It has Jalal and it has Jamal. He's Dhul Jalali wal Ikram. And this is his book. So it's coming with both Izza and Rahma. In order for you to warn a people, that you should warn a people. And then the Ma, and this is one of the interesting things about Arabic. Generally, they say that's Ma Nafia, that it's a negating Ma that they had not been warned before. That is for Al-Arab Al-Aqarib, Al-Aba Al-Aqarib, because they didn't have warners. There's a, Ahl Al-Fatra are between Ismail and the Prophet Sallallahu Those are the Ahl Al-Fatra, because the Arabs didn't have messengers from Ismail on. But the, the Arabs before that had messengers. So some of them say that the ma there is masdariya, some say it's mausula. So it could mean, لِتُنذِرَ قَوْمًا مَا In other words, what unzira aba'uhum? What their fathers had been warned about. So you're bringing the same warning that your fathers had been warned about before. That's al-aba' al-aba'id, the far, 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 fathers that are very far away. And some say, no, it means uh, it's, uh, the, it's mausula, it means al-ladhi, right? Or, uh, you know, uh, the same thing which, that which they had been warned of before, and, or it means that, that hadn't been given a warning. That's one of the, the things about the language of Quran. It holds several meanings, and all of them are sometimes valid, because they, they relate to different things. Like, the Arabs did have warners, but they were a long time ago. And this is reminding you, it's tajdeed, it's bringing the same. Or, You've been, it's been so long that your fathers hadn't been warned, your recent fathers. So it could be either one. Fahum ghafilun. So that's the reason they're ghafilun. They're ghafilun. What is ghafla? Ghafla. Huh? What's that? Ghafwa is sleeping. Yeah, ghafla is more like heedlessness. Somebody who's in a heedless state is called ghafil. The simpleton or a fool is called mughafal. 
because they're easy to trick. So they're, they're not paying attention. Like people that fall for Ponzi schemes would be called mughaffalun. You know, because they're not thinking. They're easy to trick. So ghafla is about heedlessness. Imam al-Junaid said all of sin or wrong action is rooted in ghafla. That's the basis of it. That if you were really aware of God, you could never sin. If God was present in your heart, it would be impossible to sin. Ya ayyuhal insan, ma gharraka bi rabbik al-kareem. You know, Allah said, oh, you human being, what has... What has put you in this state of delusion about your Lord? One of the Mufassirun said, He put his answer to the question in the question itself. What has, what has taken you away from your generous Lord in that you think that you can do these things that you can do and you're not going to be taken into account? What, what did it? Where's the jawab? Where's the answer in the question? Your generosity. Because people can only sin when they're experiencing the generosity of creation. That's when they sin. You can take something for nothing when you think there's something that can be taken for nothing. That's when you steal. So Allah is so generous to his creation that sometimes people forget. And that's what ghafla is. It's a forgetfulness. It's a state of forgetfulness. The Arabs before Islam were in a state of ghafla. They're in a state of ghafla now. The whole world is in a state of ghafla. You know, welcome to planet Earth. I mean, six billion people and we're all in a state of ghafla. It's amazing. So who, who's, who's, if, 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 if all the doctors are sleeping, who's going to tend to the patients? We were in a madhouse. The asylums, you know, one of the crazy people got the key and they've let all the doors open and all the doctors are sleeping. And then we're wondering why there's wars all over the place. Why there, Because the people that are supposed to be running the insane asylum are in ghafla themselves. Or they've gone mad. <laughs> you know, inna la fi uh, you know, we're in a time that's so extreme in its madness. If it doesn't drive you mad, you are mad already. <laughs> Welcome to the modern world. <laughs> yeah. And then they wonder why Fort Hood and, you know, and Cleveland and Florida and what, you know, pe people are going mad because the world has gone mad. It, it's an insane situation. And the psychiatrists, you know, when they go mad, they're supposed to be treating the mad people. And that's exactly my point, is that when, when, when the people that are treating have gone mad, you know that things are bad. Because the Muslims are actually supposed to help people. <laughs> you know, we, Algeria, who's from Algeria here? Nobody's from Algeria. Uh, Moroccans, I know. There's <laughs> Nobody's from Algeria. Algeria, 200 years ago, was sending aid to Europe during the famine. Wheat. Aid to Europe during their famine. Algeria. I'm not making that up. It's Algerian history. Sending aid. Like now you have Western countries send aid to Muslim countries. Only 200 years ago, Muslim countries were sending aid to Western countries. One of the things about ghafla, a word that's interesting in, in English is called acedia. It's, it's not really used anymore. And it's interesting words that disappear, right? like sin. Do you ever ever hear anybody use that word anymore? <laughs> sin, seriously. People, uh, you'll never hear sin. Have you ever heard anybody on TV say sin? They don't, unless it's Sunday on those funny channels. <laughs> and then they use it too much. That's all they use. <laughs> Which leads one to wonder what's going on there too. <laughs> 
But sin is a beautiful word. Khati'a in Arabic is sin. You know, what do you, does anybody know the original meaning of khati'a in Arabic? Hmm? It's a mistake, but it's a term that the Arabs used for something that they did. Hmm? It's an archer's term. In, in classical Arabic, the khati'a was to miss the mark. You know what sin means in Old English? It's an archer's term, to miss the mark. Yeah, I'm not making that what she says seriously. No, I'm making up. Google, you're, you've got Google. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> yeah. She missed the mark. It's all right. <laughs> the, uh, but the, what is the idea of missing the mark if that's what a sin is? What's the idea behind that? This is a very interesting idea. If you miss the mark and that's a sin, what's the idea behind that? You were trying to get the bullseye, but you missed it. So you were trying to do something good. And that's why human beings, even when they sin, they're actually trying to get a benefit for themselves. But they've misplaced the benefit. They see the vice as a virtue. But it's actually, they wouldn't do something if they didn't think there was something in it for them. Humans don't do that. So they're aiming for something that they think is good for them, but they've missed the mark. And that's what the prophets are about. They come with taswib. They're the ones that teach you how to aim properly. No, you're, you're, you're too short. You're too far. Extremism, right? You're either too liberal or you're too conservative. Muslims are independent. <laughs> I would never join a party. And, and like Mark said, I would never join a party that would have me as a member. <laughs> I would never join a party, really, any party, except Hezbollah. And that's not the one in Lebanon. <laughs> they shouldn't use these terms. You know, call yourself something else, you know. Seriously, it's such arrogance to do that. I'm sorry, with all respect to whoever and whatever, it's arrogance to say that you're, I mean, that's a da'wah. Allah knows who. The, and, so you haven't defeated Israel yet. You know, hum al that's what Allah says. People that are, are his, his, he will give them victory, always, in everything. And if you're not, you should worry about where you are. But Muslims have to be very careful. All these claims, you know, these claims. We, just, we make so many claims. And we get into politics and then people get mad. He's dissing Hezbollah. Allah. لَقَدْ حَقَّ الْقَوْرُ عَلَىٰ أَكْثَرِهِمْ فَهُمْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ the qawl, haqq al qawl, thabat al qawl, it's been confirmed on the majority of them that they're not believers. They don't believe. And haqq al qawl am la anna jahannama min al jinnati wa nasi ajma'in. That Allah has ashab al nar, there's people for the fire. That's what that means. We have placed in their necks aglaw, these collars. And they're big collars, so they can't bend their neck. They're up to the chin. And some say the ghul is the, the hand, so they're actually tied like this that it's like that. So they have collars that have their hands tied up because the ghul is a qaid for al yad. So Allah, and this, this is what's called uh, in balagha isti'ara tamthiliya. 
it's, it's, it's an example that is it's using very expressive language, figures of speech, to create an understanding in the mind, like a metaphor that, you know, when you say, Zaydun uh, Asadun, uh, Zayd is a lion. You don't mean that Zayd is an animal that has a mane and teeth and uh, growls or roars. You mean that he's courageous. So it's a way of driving that point home and creating a tamthil, an image in the mind of a person that enables them to really see the, the reality of these people's state. So that is the majority of scholars say this because it's talking about these people specifically who were being called to Islam. And what's worse about them is that they weren't even interested in examining the proposition. And that's what acedia is. The word acedia is translated, it's a Latin term, but it's translated as sloth. But in Christian theology, acedia was not laziness that people are lazy in their work. It was spiritual laziness, that people weren't interested in finding out the truth. That's what acedia is. And so this is really the warning about people that are suffering from spiritual acedia, that they're like people that have their, uh, their and there, there's no humility. Because what do people do when they're humble? They lower their, their chins down to their breast. How did the Prophet come into Mecca? With his chin on his breast. That's how he came in as a conqueror. If that was his state when he was a conqueror, then what was his state in, in normal circumstances? Because when you're conquering, that's, that's the time to jump up and down and, and, uh, and, and that's when, what people do. Like these people when they won the World Series, they didn't come out with their chins bowed down and humble and said, it's such an incredible honor to defeat a team like the Phillies and, and we just were humbled by this victory. And you know, no, they were jumping up and down and gloating, shamata, right? Really, that's, that's what people do, right? It's, it's very different. In the old days in sports, you actually went out and shook the hands of the people and said what a great game you played. Because sports was to teach people about humility and being gentlemen and be, really that's what sports was about. It wasn't about this. This this is all new modern spectacle. It's not it's not sportsmanship. It's not how sports was. It's just modern man and woman fallen. Yeah, that's all it is. See, and that and that's what that that's what uh, this is talking about. It's arrogance. It's people with their heads high. And then Allah says, "Fahum muqmahum." Muqmahum is a term taken from camels, right? Qamah al jamal fahuwa qamihum. The camel, when they would take them to water and it would raise its head up and refuse to go down and drink. That's what the camel, I mean, I, I lived with camels, so I know camels are very bright animals. You know, camels, first of all, the first time I rode a camel, it knew immediately that I'd never ridden a camel. And I grew up riding horses. Horses and camels are very different. But literally the first thing the camel did, it took me to a thorn bush and started like rubbing me in the thorn bush. <laughs> you know, and all the Bedouin, they were just laughing their heads off. They just, they just thought that was hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't. I had scratches all over and, you know. But I learned after that to let them know right away that I knew exactly what the game was. Like I was being nice to the camel. No. You hit them right on that little, they have a little nodule right on the top of their head, and boom, you give them a good little whack, and suddenly they're nice, and everything's wonderful. Yeah. But they're, they're very, they're filled with pride, and you know, they're, and they, they look around and do this thing. That's the muqmah, you know, qamihun. They, they're, they're arrogant. I'm, Quran. Why should I read that book? Well, because one out of every four people actually thinks it's from God. That, that seems like a pretty good reason just to be interested in it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Doesn't that seem logical? Just to read it and see maybe there's something in there?
وجعلنا من بين أيديهم سدا ومن خلفهم سدا فأغشيناهم فهم لا يبصرون and we put before them a, a, a sud which is like a barrier or sud in Hafs it's a barrier سدا ومن خلفهم سدا فأغشيناهم so there's a barrier in front of them which is their understanding of akhirah they, they, don't, they don't know where they're going. They don't know where they're that they're going to be dead and raised up. And also, وَمِنْ خَلْفِهِمْ سُدًّا And behind them, they don't even know where they've come from. So there are people trapped in temporality. They don't know past, because if they reflected on the past, they would know that the destiny of the people of the past is their destiny. They're trapped in temporality. They're, they're, and فَأَغْشَيْنَاهُمْ and over them is a rishawa. Right? They have, there's a veil over their eyes. They can't see. فَهُمْ لَا يُبَصِرُونَ They don't have penetrating sight. Basira. وَسَوَاءٌ عَلَيْهِمُ أَنْذَرْتُهُمُ أَمْ لَمْ تُنْذِرْهُمْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ It's the same whether you warn them or you don't warn them. They don't believe. Now the problem, and this is important for Muslims, one of the problems with modern Muslims is they assume everybody's kafir if they're not Muslim. These verses aren't talking to everybody who's not a Muslim. They're talking about people who are arrogant, puffed up, filled with pride, and wouldn't give you the time of day. Read the, uh, the descriptions of the kuffar in the Quran. They're jawal, they're mutakabbir, yistakbirun, they're مُخْتَالٌ فَخُورٌ They're ظَالِمُونَ I mean, these are the attributes that Allah gives them. Most people are nas. A lot of them are just in ghafla. They're just nas. That's why Allah first calls people يَا أَيُّهَا nas before He calls them يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ or يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا He calls them يَا أَيُّهَا nas Because initially He didn't call the Arabs يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ because they weren't kafirun. But after seeing miracles, after witnessing everything that they had witnessed, and treating the Prophet the way they treated for doing nothing other than calling them to their own success, Allah said, Haq al -qawl. No, this is, it's, this is too much. You can't get away with this. So it's important, you know, that people should not apply these things to people that they see out there walking around. The majority of these people, even though they have a legal status, which is outside of Islam, you don't assume about people that, I mean, I'll give you an example. And this, this is, it's, you know, it's just an example from my own experience. You know, I, I made a statement right after 9-11 where I said, if it was in an interview with a newspaper, that if there were any martyrs in that event, it would have been the firefighters. And, and somebody went to my teacher in Saudi Arabia, my teacher, Sheikh Abdul bin Baya, and said that I said that the, the kuffar were shuhada. Now, it's a very interesting. I mean, first of all, Sheikh Abdullah said, what word did he use? Did he say shaheed? He said, no, he said martyr. He said, well, look it up in the dictionary. And because he, he knows French, he said martyr. He said, it's true, they're martyrs. Because in French, a martyr is the one that gives his life for other people. <laughs> That, that's called manduha, you know. I mean, the, you know, the, the thing about Muslims is they're supposed to actually look for excuses for people. <laughs> so he was just being a good Muslim. <laughs> but anyway, my point is that the assumption was they were kuffar. Did you check those firemen? Did you go and ask them what they believed and how? The, the basis is not kuffar, it's iman. People are believers before they're disbelievers. The assumption about people is belief before it's disbelief. Because belief is a fitra state. Isn't our deen, deen al-fitra? Don't we believe that people are actually by fitra inclined to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So their inherent state is belief. And disbelief is actually a state that comes later. Because of arrogance for whatever reasons. But these are problems. Too severe, you're making things too... To, it's just simple, kuffar, muslimun. Just makes everything easy. You know, just Red Sea, split it.
we're on that side, they're on that side. Well, not me. You know, I'm a convert. <laughs> okay, so I know what it's like on both sides. Because I've been on both sides. And, and by the way, Kuntum khaira ummatin ukhrijat linnas, you were the best people, past tense. No, seriously. That's the tafsir. Read it for yourself. Muslims talk about kuntum khaira, and they think like it's present tense. We're the best people. No, you, what, what, what are you doing for humanity right now? Where's, where's your great medical discoveries? You know, where's, where's your aid to starving countries? What are you doing for Darfur? What are you, you know, I mean, seriously, what? Just tu'minuna billahi, right? And then what? Ta'muruna bil ma'ruf wa tanhawna anil munkar. It's not just iman billah. You have to be actually out there doing things to get the khayriya in this ummah. But that's a past tense. Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat linnas. That group were all converts. For people that, uh, you, you know, your daughter's too good to marry to the convert because, you know, you're, uh, you've got your tree that goes back 12 generations. And he doesn't even know who his great-grandfather was. Just something to think about. إِنَّمَا تُنْذِرُ مَنِ اتَّبَعَ ذِكْرَ وَخَشْيَ الرَّحْمَانَ بِالْغَيْبِ فَبَشِّرْهُ بِمَغْفِرَةٍ وَأَجْرٍ كَرِيمٍ Surely you warn the one who will follow this reminder has khashya of the merciful when nobody else is looking. Because you know, a munafiq will display outwardly, but when nobody's there, what's between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's where it counts. فَبَشِّرْهُ Give him bushra. So there's the indhar. You warn them about what happens if you don't follow this, but if they follow it, they have bushra. Give them bushra of forgiveness for any of their shortcomings, their sins, missing the mark, falling short. And a great and generous reward. إِنَّا نَحْنُ نُحْيِ الْمَوْتَى وَنَكْتُبُ مَا قَدَّمُوا آثَارَهُمْ وَكُلَّ شَيْءٍ أَحْصَيْنَاهُ فِي إِمَامٍ مُبِينٍ So, Allah, and this is at the essence of Yasin. We bring the dead to life. وَنَكْتُبُ مَا قَدَّمُوا وَآثَارَهُمْ And we write down everything that they are bringing forward to the Yawm Qiyamah, all of their actions, وَآثَارَهُمْ And any traces they leave behind, what they bring forward and what they leave behind. That's all going to be أَحْصَيْنَاهُ وَضَبَطْنَاهُ We've given it specific accounting and reckoning. Fi uh, imamim mubin. The imam here is the book. Fi kitabim mubin. Because the book it leads you, right? The book leads you. Fi imamim mubin. In a clear book, the naktubu. The malaika write everything down. Benu Benu Salama were a tribe outside of Medina, and they were between the Quraysh. Mecca and Medina itself. I mean, they're, they're in Medi just outside Medina, but if the Quraysh came, they would have come and met up with Bani Salama. And they were a very strong tribe. But they used to go every morning, and it would take them a long time to walk to the masjid. And so they told the Prophet ﷺ that they wanted to come move into Medina so that they could pray with him Fajr and not have to walk so far. The Prophet ﷺ was troubled that it would leave uh, an opening for the enemies in Medina so that they could get them at dawn or something or sneak up on them. And, but on the other hand, he was very compassionate and saw that they were trying to come to Fajr and that. So Allah, this verse was revealed to let them know that those, that walking you're doing every morning, it's all in your uh, book. And 
alhamdulillah. So Asma's just got up and I'm done and that's a good place to end. Inshallah, may Allah put this all in our book on the Yawm Qiyamah, in the good book, on the good side. Jazakum Allah khairan, subhanak Allah wa bihamdika, ashadu an la ilaha ila anta astaghfiruk wa atubu ilayk, wa la hawla wa raqwata illa billah al-aliyya al-azim. Alhamdulillah, jazallahu anna sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam khairan ma jazayta nabiyyan an ummatihi, ameen. الحمد لله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى آله وصحابته ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم افتح لنا حكمتك وانشر علينا رحمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام وصل اللهم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله الكرام ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم Alhamdulillah, the, uh, the Yasin has uh, different names. Um, it's actually, according to the ulama, it's called al Muamma in the Torah. So it's actually mentioned in the Torah according to the, the ulama, which is the, 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 the thing that encompasses all good. It's, uh, you know, there's many weak hadiths and some of them are fabricated hadiths, but the reason why Muslims historically in most places have recited Yasin in the morning and the evening, or in the morning at least, is because there's hadiths uh, that are narrated in the books that don't really have any strong chains, but about the, that Yasin is, Yasin lima qurya lah, Yasin is for what it's read for, so if you read it with an intention, I mean, I once, I had an experience many, many years when I first became Muslim. You know, I'd only been a Muslim about a year, and I lost something incredibly valuable. And uh, the Nigerian man told me, if you read Yasin 41 times, you'll get it back. So, you know, I didn't know any better. So I just, I stayed up the whole night and read Yasin 41 times. And sure enough, the next day, <laughs> I got it back. It was pretty miraculous, so... Those things increase your faith, even if they're not based on sound hadith or anything like that. So the uh, we we got to فَأَغْشَيْنَا هُمْ فَهُمْ لَا يُبَصِّرُونَ. This is about. Uh, people that whose hearts get sealed, which happens to people. And that's why it's so dangerous to, uh, to ignore signs from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because at a certain point, um, it's, you're rejecting the generosity of your Lord. And uh, just like a generous host, they can lose their, their generosity with you. I mean, even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is arham ar-rahimin, akram ar-akramin, He's the most merciful of those who show mercy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that فَعَالُوا لِمَا يُرِيدُ In fact, many of the Sahaba, there are several versions of this, but they revolve around a statement that all of the Qur'an, كُلُّ الْقُرْآنِ يَنْتَهِ إِلَى فَعَالُوا لِمَا يُرِيدُ He does whatever he wants. All of the Qur'an revolves around that essential meaning. فَعَالُوا لِمَا يُرِيدُ God does whatever he wants. And that's one of the things about Muslims, why they've never had. One of the things that the Archbishop in England said after the tsunami is this is something that troubles people's faith. Do you know? At, at, which was surprising for me because for a Muslim, things like that don't trouble their faith if they really understand their faith. Because God is the God of tsunamis. I mean, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you read the Quran, it's filled with uh, stories of great destruction. And Allah does whatever He wants. And then we also set aside our judgment. 
He's not asked, he's not responsible, really, responsible for what he does. In other words, he doesn't have to respond to you and tell you why he did something. But they will be responsible for what they do. So get your, your judgment correctly. In other words, ask yourselves about what you're doing. Don't ask Allah about what he's doing. We didn't oppress them. But they were oppressing themselves. God does not oppress his servants. In fact, Imam al-Ghazali said, it's impossible for God to oppress because oppression, the very nature of oppression, is tasarruf fi mulk al ghayr bi ghayri idnihi. It's to, to, to take the property of another without his permission and do what you want with it. That is oppression. So if you are the possession of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's no oppression. Allah can do, He can, la qadrullah, sallamukum Allah. He can give us cancer, He can give us. Alzheimer's, he can take our children, he can take our spouses, he can do whatever he wants. And that is a tajalli of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But people that preoccupy themselves with that are often in total heedlessness about all that he's doing for them of blessing. There's people that are filled with blessings, they say, I can't believe in God, why not? Well, look at China, or look at Darfur, or look at it has nothing to do with them. It's something outside of themselves that they even, if you take an extreme solipsistic philosophical view, they don't even know if China really exists. It might just be <laughs> in your head. <laughs> I mean, there's actually philosophers that argue that, that it's all in your head. This, we're in the matrix. You know, there, there are philosophers that do say that. So it's all just a test. This is only a test. Had it been real, you would have been notified. <laughs> they used to have those on TV when I was little. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can cut off. And he tells us about certain people, it doesn't matter if you warn them or you don't warn them, they're not going to believe. But those who, who benefit from this, that benefit from this warning, are those who follow this reminder, a dhikr. One of the things about calling the Qur'an dhikr, a reminder or a remembrance. Dhakara in Arabic, the root meaning of it, the kartuhu, means to kick somebody in the groin. A male. Because dhakar is male, right? Dhakara means to be kicked in the groin. That's what dhikr... It's... You, you know, somebody gets kicked in the groin, they're present. <laughs> they're not thinking about something else. They're right there with you. Right? That, the, the dhikr that Allah is giving us is reminding us of what our hearts know already. It's resonating in the hearts. Alastu bi rabbikum. Am I not your Lord? We've already heard that. And it's resonating. So the reminder is what causes one to become present again with their Lord. And that's why the people whose hearts are more open to this, whose hearts are more subtle, the whose hearts are more supple, they're the ones that can open up to this reminder. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they, وَخَشْيَ الرَّحْمَانَ بِالْغَيْبِ Khashya is something, إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاءِ Those who have khashya are those who know Allah. Only those who have some knowledge of Allah have khashya. If you don't know Allah, and ilm of Allah, you can be a very simple person and have knowledge of God. The, the famous story of Ar-Razi, when he was walking, he was on his way to the madrasa, and there were like all these students behind him. And the Prophet ﷺ said, it's a fitna to have people following behind you. He said, "Kafa bin Mar'i fitna and to shara ilahi and you shara ilahi bir banan." Oh, come on, that it's enough as as a tribulation that people say, "Look, there's so and so." I mean, that's enough of a fitna because being uh, known is a fitna. But he was being followed by all these people, and this old woman said, "Who's that?" You know, like, what's the big deal? And one of the students said, "You don't know who that is." He has 70 proofs for the existence of God. And the old woman said, if he didn't have 70 doubts, he wouldn't need 70 proofs. <laughs> and Fakhruddin al-Razi said, alaykum bi iman al-ajais. Have the faith of old women. <laughs> 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 
So, khashya is fear with knowledge. A dog cannot have khashya. You can't say al kalb yakhshani in Arabic. Khashya is related to knowledge. You can say yakhafuni al kalb, it's more likely that takhaf al kalb, you fear the dog. But if the dog is afraid of you, you would say yakhafuni al kalb. You can't say yakhshani al kalb. Because khashya is something that's related to having knowledge. And so, if you look, they have knowledge that God is aware of them. You see? That, because normally you fear things that are present or imminent, but you know they're out there. Whereas this is something unseen. It's something hidden from you, and yet you have a knowledge of it which gives you khashya. And then... Uh, so give him bushra. Bushra, bashara in Arabic means what? Bashara. Huh? What's bashara tun? Tun, bashara tun. Skin, right? The human is called bashar because one of the things about humans is unlike animals, I mean, dogs, you can see joy when they're jumping up and down or something like that, but. Um, Humans actually show their expression in their faces. So you see joy on the skin, like literally people uh, have that. So the bashar is the one with skin, without feathers or fur. It's one of the blessings that Allah has given human beings, which is why we cover ourselves with ornaments. Take your ornaments. These are ornaments, just like uh, birds have plumage, Animals have fur. What's more beautiful than a sinjab? You know, if you see a squirrel with a bushy tail, it's stunning, especially the red squirrels. There's beauty in furs, which is why humans like to wear furs. The, the, the blessing of gi being given skin is one of the great gifts that Allah has given us is that we have, and then our hair is an ornament. It's not there really, uh, you know, it, it has, I'm, bald people do fine, but hair has... A, it has a, 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 you know, bald people, it's not a problem with lack of hair. It's usually distribution. <laughs> because it's a high testosterone, so they often have a lot of hair in other places. People don't know that. I was told that by a bald person. <laughs> but it's a gift to have hair. You know, it's, it's, a, it's an ornament. The Prophet actually said, Akrimu, you know, honor your hair. And he used to put duhun in his hair and take care of his hair. In fact, he had so much oil that they said they used to see the oil on his shawl from the hair. And he used olive oil. And I was told recently by a friend of mine who's a dermatologist that all of the stuff that they sell is a complete scam and a waste of time. He said the best thing for your skin, ladies, is olive oil. <laughs> Which is exactly what the Prophet ﷺ said to use. Iddehinu bizayta zaytun fa innahum in shajara mubaraka. You know, use olive oil because it's a blessed, it's from a blessed tree. So giving bushra is giving good news, and that good news is a joyous thing that affects people. It shows up on their uh, faces. So, and when, when you know you've been forgiven, what greater joy? I mean, people, when, when they get the, you know, when the jury comes and, and they give a not guilty charge, look what happens to the people. You know, you can just see the relief. You can see the... So imagine if you were told that you're going to be forgiven for eternity. What, what greater joy? <laughs> I mean, if that's what happens when you're just being possibly three years in prison or five years or ten years and, you know, there's this joy that happens, what happens when you're told you're not only going to be forgiven, but you're going to be given a great and generous reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then, inna nahnu nuhyan mawta, to remind you that this is real. The reward is coming. We are going to bring people back to life. We will bring the dead back to life for the resurrection. Wa naktubu, 
ما قدموا some of the ulama say it's in the lawh al-mahfuz here and some say it's what the angels write because the the angels record everything that we do Allah doesn't need angels but he's created a world of asbab you have efficient cause you have formal cause you have different type material cause you have different types of causes Allah is 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 in reality the efficient cause of everything he is the one that causes everything in reality and in fact if you take an extreme occasionalist ash'ari view there is no real causation in the world that that's the 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 ash'ari view which is probably being substantiated by modern physics in a lot of ways um, Hume was the first person in the West to kind of recognize the possibility that causation is just a, the mind associating cause and effect but uh, Allahu alam that, that's, that's what I was taught لَا يُقَارُ يُقْتَعُ بِالسِّكِينِ وَنَمَا مِثْرُهُ يُقَارُ فِي التَّسْخِينِ فَإِنَّ فِعْرُهُ لَهُ بِوَاسِطَ أَحَادَهُ أُلُو الْعُقُولَ الضَّابِطَ don't say the knife cuts, don't say fire burns, uh, because that his action should have any intermediary is something that people of intellect understand to not be true. That there's no, that Allah is the direct cause of all things. And so, um, everything has been written in the Lawah al Mahfuz what Allah has given us according, and this is the dominant view, this is what the Imam al-Tahawi puts forward, this is what uh, uh, Abu Bakr al-Baqallani, Imam al-Maturidi, Imam al-Ash'ari, I mean most of the Imams of Kalam uh, and Tawheed, Usul al-Din put forward the idea of kisb, that really what we have is we earn through our intentions, but actions and everything else is directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that He is the one that in any is instant is giving you your istita'a. And, and Imam al-Tahawi in his Tahawiyah talks about two types of istita'a. The istita'a that is related to actions at the time of the action, and that is from Allah directly. And then there's the istita'a that is relate your ability that precedes the action, and that is what you are uh, taken to account for. It's your abilities that precede an action. The action itself is from Allah, and we believe that everything is is maktub in that way. But we're not determinists, and we're not pure free will. It's it's between the two. If you want a very simplistic but quite brilliant. Uh, presentation of this, Sayyidina Ali uh, was once asked about is Al uh, Insan Mukhayyar Am Musayyar? Is he free or determined? And this is a big debate in the history of Islam. And Imam Ali told him, Lift your right leg. And he lifted his right leg. And he said, Now without putting it down, lift your left leg. And he said, I can't. He says, Between the two. You know, that, that, that we have volition and yet we have constraints that are determined. We, Allah determined our form. He determined the levels of intellect we have. He determined our parents. He determined our socioeconomic status as we came into the world. There are many things that were far, that, that just outside of our capacity entirely. But all of our experience in the world tells us that we are volitional agents, that we have agency. And this is what we are, this is what's written, ma qaddamu. What you bring forward to God. It's your volition, your agency. You have irada. This is, God has given you irada. And that's why we believe that people are responsible for their actions. Unless, رُفِعَ عَنْ الْقَلَمُ وَعَنْ ثَلَاثِ There's three that the pen has been raised up from. The sleeper uh, until he wakes up. The sick person if he's mad or something like that. Uh, you know, the, the people that are, are doing uh, wrong actions out of madness. Like if this person at Fort Hood was mad and it can be established that he was mad, then he's not responsible for his actions. You can't blame him. Even if he shouted Allahu Akbar, he's not responsible for his actions. Something, maybe listening to all those stories because he had been treating people with post-traumatic stress syndrome and people that had seen babies killed and maybe actually shot civilians or saw things horrific things beyond our imagination maybe those things drove that person mad and he just he went crazy he 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 cracked because human beings can can break 
Rifqan Birqawarir. The Prophet said, go, go easy on the women because their hearts are brittle. You can break a woman's heart. You know, she can pull her hair out. Women go mad if they're mistreated uh, to, to, to terrible degrees. So people do lose it. And in those cases, the, that, that, that person is not responsible for their actions. But if he, he was responsible, if he thought, if it was premeditated, if he, no, then he is responsible and he needs to be tried and, 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 uh, and those need to be proved. And that's the way our uh, legal system works. But on Yom Qiyamah, Allah is going to reveal to us the realities. The Prophet said, Umirtu an ahkum bidhawahir. I was commanded to judge by outward thing. I can't, we don't know the inward reality of people. We don't know why people do things. We don't know the wisdom behind it. So only Allah can judge people in reality. That's why you cannot condemn anybody. Ibn Abbas said, لا ننزل أحدا. He said, لا ينبغي لي أحدا أن ينزل أحدا في النار أو في الجنة. Nobody can say somebody's in hell or paradise. Nobody. We don't have that right or authority. Only Allah determines that. And if you do that, you, you put yourself in a very precarious position based on the hadith about the man who did that and was sent to hell for doing that to another person without any right to do that. And that includes everybody. Everybody. You don't know. Henry Kissinger, everybody. You don't know. Only God can judge people. I mean, if I was a gambling man. <laughs> Gambling's haram. And then the, the, the athar are written also. So the people, that can mean people that come after you and follow you. That's one of the benefits. Because if you leave a knowledge that people benefit by you, those are your athar. Tilka atharuna tadulu alayna fanduru ba'dana ila al-athari. One of the poets of Andalusia said, these are what we left behind. So look at what we left behind to know who we were. And that's a question for all of us to ask, what are we going to leave behind? What institutions are we going to leave behind for the future generations? Because those are things that are written in our, in our mizan, what we leave behind. Sadaqa jariya, like nahran ajara. You know, even if you make canals for agriculture, like Zubaydah, I mean, the wife of uh, Harun al-Rashid, those, those canals are still there in Mecca. They're not working anymore. But for centuries, they were bringing water. And, and that was all in her mizan. And I, that's why I'm mentioning her today, after a thousand years. Because she did a great thing for the Muslims. And she did it from private. It wasn't like a public works. That was her own. Historically, most of the rulers, when they built institutions, they did not do it from public funds. They did it from their own wealth. People forget that. And, and then he says, وَكُلَّ شَيْءٍ أَحْصَيْنَاهُ You know, we ضَبَطْنَاهُ we, we have put it specifically في إمام مبين. And this is in a clear book. A clear book. And here it's, it's the لوح المحفوظ. And then he says, وَضْرِبْ لَهُمْ مَثَلًا Strike a similitude, uh, 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 an analogy for them or, or a similitude or how does he uh, translate it there? An example, probably better translation. Uh, method can mean a lot of things. It can be a proverb. Uh, it can be uh, an example. Um, he, here it would be an example. Um, and then the ashab al-qariya, the, the, the people of this village. Some of the ulama, one of the things about the stories of Quran, and Khalid Blankenship told me something very interesting. He said one of the fascinating aspects of the Quran for a historian other than the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi things that are mentioned about that community there's nothing for a historian to prove or disprove unlike the Bible which is one of the problems with a lot of modern uh, biblical exegesis is that the Germans who studied the Bible a hundred years ago found many historical discrepancies in the biblical narrations because they had things that they could actually have historical examples. Did Herod take a poll tax in this year? And they found out that he didn't. 
and yet the Bible says he did. There are many examples of historical discrepancies, whereas in the Quran, there's nothing a historian could say that didn't happen. But he said, but also, it's sacred history. We believe it. It's in the Quran. We believe it. But to prove that uh, Moses met up with Fir'aun as a historian, historians don't, they, they don't accept these as historical fact. This is revelation for us. Uh, there's debates amongst historians about whether or not even Jesus existed, which for us is far-fetched. But um, all of the, the, those previous uh, teachings are not historical. One of the interesting things about Islam is it's the only religion revealed in the light of history which would seem appropriate for the age of history when people were suddenly historical people. People understood the past. One of the things all of us learn in American education is basic history. You learn about the Egyptians. You learn about uh, uh, Ur and Babylon, hopefully. I don't know what they teach anymore, but you're supposed to learn these things. You learn about the French Revolution, you know, the Norman invasion of England, right? Didn't that happen? It, you don't know? <laughs> it, it did. Yeah. It's, it's mutawatar. So, yeah. so the... Uh, So they say that this happened in Antioch, this story that we're being told. So they came to this village at Mursalun. Now, the Mursalun here, most of the ulama that talk about this in the tafsir say that it, it's actually the apostles of Jesus. So these were not messengers, prophets. They were the apostles of a, of a, a rasul. That, that's... There's difference of opinion, so there's nothing fixed on this because the Prophet ﷺ did not tell us, there's, there's not hadith that indicate, but because of a lot of Christians who had become Muslim, and one of the things about people, Muslims don't understand this, that a lot of Muslims don't understand this, that Christians in the Middle East were of many stripes. The, the, the Orthodox Christians were only one group, the Catholics, the Orthodox, the Great Schism of 1054, when the two traditions split, you got the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Western Catholic Church. So you had New Rome, which was built in the 5th century there in, uh, in, in Turkey, what becomes the center of Orthodox tradition. And then you have the Old Rome, which is the center of Catholic tradition. But in Africa and in the Middle East, and even in India, Kashmir, Places like Malabar. People don't know about the Nasrani Christians of Malabar that are still there. And they're called Nasranis. I'm not making this up. Seriously. <laughs> they're called Nasranis. They're Jewish Christians. They're like Ebionites. When the Portuguese found them, they were so disturbed that they destroyed their churches. They burnt their books. This is history. Because the Portuguese, when they got there in the 16th century, they found these Jewish Christians that b thought Jesus was a man and not God. And it really bothered them. So they completely obliterated, and they, they've had to re-piece their tradition. But they're still there, the Malibari Nasaranis. They're called Nasara. So there were Christians, there were Aryan Christians, Bishop Arian from Egypt. The Aryans were all over North uh, Africa. The Moroccans were Aryan Christians. The Berbers were animists. But the Moroccan, many of the Christians in Morocco, the, the Gothic people of Andalusia were largely Aryans. They weren't Catholics. When the Muslims came and said Jesus was a man, they, they said, you're not telling us anything we didn't know already. One of the interesting things about the, 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 uh, the, the, the Aramaic-speaking Christians of Syria is when, when the Muslims came and they said, our prophet is Muhammad, well, paraclete in, in, in John 16, when it talks about the paraclete coming, paraclete in uh, Aramaic is Muhammadan. So they were like, that sounds a lot like Muhammad. <laughs> I'm not making this up. It's just history. So you had Christians becoming Muslim. They were bringing their stories in. 
that, like, do you know that people think Ashab al-Kahf is a, uh, like, a f- folklore? First of all, as far as I know, nobody at the time of the Prophet, and I've never seen this anywhere, said that these were Asatir al awwalin when Salman al-Farisi was asked about the people that إِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ لَا تُفْسِدُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ قَالَ إِنَّمَا نَحْنُ مُصْرِحُونَ When you say to them, don't sow corruption in the earth, they say, we're setting things right. Salman was asked about them, he said, لَمْ يَأْتِ بَعْد They haven't come yet. Those are people who will come later. That means there's people mentioned in the Qur'an that haven't come yet. It's only very recently that they're calling these traditions folkloric. There's whole movements to say the Bible is folklore. All these stories are folklore. That's what Allah says in the Quran. They say that these asatirul awalin, these are just the myths of ancient people. So it's very interesting that uh, that these these stories that we've been given, the Christians, when they saw these things, they recognized things that they knew. The Christians of Syria and, and Palestine, and you had Melkite Christians that are still there. You had the, the uh, Syriac Christians. You had the Jacobites. You had the Nestorians. You had the Arians. They had many traditions. In fact, uh, tom- tomorrow, I published a, I translated several of the Arabic traditions of Jesus and many of them are not in the Hadith, they're just stories that Christians brought in and you don't find them in the Old Testament, because, in the New Testament because they were stories from other traditions. We forget that the four Gospels are only four out of many. There were 30 Gospels at the Council of Nicaea when they decided on the four canonical Gospels. There were other Gospels. There were other narratives. There were alternative views. There were Christians that thought Jesus was a Jew, that you had to be circumcised, that you had to follow the Sabbath. You couldn't eat pork. And they followed Jesus. They, what happened to them? The Ebionites, Semitic Christians. Hans Kuhn said, we have a historical paradox. When Ebionitic Christianity, which dies out in the Middle East in the 3rd century, emerges in the 7th century, with the coming of Islam. The same views about Christianity, and yet we see no historical link. How did that happen? That's one of the major theologians of the 20th century saying, this is strange indeed. Let's try to find some historical connection. Like Thor Heyderall, who, who when they, you know, we find pyramids in South America and pyramids in Egypt, there must be a connection. Instead of seeing that Humans are just pyramid builders, like birds in South America build nests and birds in Africa build nests and they don't necessarily exchange communication about it. But there are materialists that have to believe everything is connected in some material way as opposed to this is from outside of the material realm, that there's a principial realm, there's a spiritual realm, and this is something that is fascinating about Islam for anybody who's willing to look at it. If you were read Paul Ehrman's Ar- Ar- books, uh, like Misquoting Jesus, and you, this poor man lost his faith. He was a devout fundamentalist Christian who went to Princeton or Harvard and studied at their theological seminaries, got into critical analyses, studied the German text, and ended up not believing in the Bible anymore. And everything that he says that was proven by this research is confirmed in the Quran. So I feel like telling them, look, you, you don't need to lose your faith. <laughs> you know, there's just a new and improved version. <laughs> you know, it, made the, it got the bugs out. You know, it's like don't give up the software. You know, just update your hard drive. <laughs> so they, they, two of them came. So these two came to this city and the the Antioch and the one of the things that we don't realize about early people that were either direct students of prophets or during that first period because 
the, the beginning of a religion is always the most powerful point. The goodness is until the end of time. The Prophet ﷺ said, Ummati kal matar. My ummah is like the rain. You don't know if the first or the last is the best. It's, there's always good. Rain brings things back to life. But the power of the religion. Also, the miracles of the religion are usually in that early period. Miracles go all through, but that early period is very powerful. The Christians were, had profound faith. They, they were uh, extraordinary healers. They used to go in and lay on hands, and people would get well, and that was how a lot of people believed. So they came to this city, and they started healing people, but they were calling them to the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the king, who was an, an idolater, um, got very upset about this, but there was a man... And so they said, You're just a man like us. Now this is an important statement because there are people that say that the Prophet is only a man. And you have to be very careful with that statement because he is indeed a man. You know, the, the extent of our knowledge is that he is a human being. The Prophet is not divine. He has no uh, divine attributes. He is a human being. But he is the best of Allah's creation. One of the ways uh, the Moroccans say, uh, you know, Muhammadun Bashirun la kal bashari, bahul kal yaquti bain al hajari. The Prophet is a human, but not like other humans. He's like an emerald amongst stones. So an emerald is a stone, but it's not like other stones. So the Prophet said, Innama ana bashar, yuha ilayya. But I have. A, an innama here in, in Balagha, and, and I, I, you know, if I had time I'd go into this, but you have different types of qasr in Balagha. Qasr al-haqiqi, qasr al-idhafi. Innama here is when, when, when he says innama ana bashar, it doesn't mean he's only a human being, but in this specific statement that he's making, he's saying I'm only a human being, but he's not just a bashar. He's other things. He's a prophet. He's a father. He's, so it's a qasr al-idhafi. It's not a haqiqi. And some people think that they, they want to bring the Prophet ﷺ down to everybody else's level. He's just a messenger, he came, he delivered the message, and that's over. No, the Prophet ﷺ, and not only that, he's active in his community until the Yom Qiyamah and beyond. He visits people in dreams. He said, if you see me in a dream, you've seen me in truth. The Prophet's still visiting people in dreams. And if you deny that, you're denying sound hadith. Man ra'ani fannawm faqad ra'ani haqqa. Whoever sees me in a dream has seen me in truth. So the Prophet is actively involved in his community. And I don't know any other religion. I don't know Buddhists telling about dreams of Buddha. Or maybe some of them imagine things. I don't know. But I don't, I've never heard that. I don't know about Christians having dreams of Jesus. I've never heard that. But Muslims, many, many Muslims have seen the Prophet and have seen him in wonderful dreams that are so vivid and true and pure and giving them advice or smiling and letting them know they're pleased or frowning and letting them know they're displeased. he's displeased with them. A man came to me once and he, uh, he saw the Prophet without a beard and he asked me what it meant and he didn't have a beard. I said, you should grow a beard. You know, because the Prophet, according to uh, uh, Sidi Abdullah ibn Hajj Ibrahim, he says, if the Prophet comes with some uh, naqs, some sort of uh, deficiency in his state, then it's to reflect what he sees in you. Because al-mu'min mir'at al-mu'min. So he's showing you your, what, what he wants to see improved in you. Wallahu a'lam. So, the, uh, and then... He, they say, you're only a man like us, like us. Prophets are men, but they're not like us. That's the difference. Because we don't get revelation. We can have inspiration, but not revelation. The merciful has not sent down anything, right? Inantum. You know, in other words, it's like a negation. Illa takribun. You're only lying. You're telling lies. Qalu rabbuna ya'lamu. That our Lord, inna ilaykum la mursalun. Our Lord knows that surely we are apostles to you. Wa ma alayna illa al balagh mubin. And upon us is only to deliver this clear message. This is what we do. And they come with proofs, and their proofs are like healing uh, the lepers and the sick and these things, and also even reviving 
the dead back to life, which happened. Those, those are miracles that we believe in. قَالُوا إِنَّا تَطَيَّرْنَا بِكُمْ They said, we, th we take a bad omen from you. It's a very interesting statement. The, the tayr in Arabic is bird. You know, كَأَنَّ عَلَى رُوسِهِمْ الطَيَّرِ The Arabs say, if people are paying attention, it was as if birds were perched on their heads. The, the tayr, the Arabs believed in augury. A-U-G, right? Augury. Augury is a type of di divination. What they would do is if they wanted to do something, and the beauty of this is that Allah, and people don't realize the rahmah of Allah. You know, people can laugh at people that go, like psychics. Did you know psychics' business has gone up since the economic downturn? Did you know that? It was in New York Times. Like, people go to psychics because they don't have a job. They're looking. I, you know, you, you can laugh at those people, but they're, it's, it's, you know, it's sad. They're, they're looking for guidance, and that's what they have. The, the, the Jahali Arabs had the same thing. Divination was their source of guidance. They were trying to get guided and do something that they thought was the right thing to do. They would go to birds that were like uh, birds that were all f f down on the ground and they would scare them and if they went to the right, they would take a good omen and they would do it. If they went to the left, they would take a bad omen. So that's called uh, tafa'al or tayyaman. Tayyaman is to uh, be positive about it Right, the Prophet said about the moon, Allahumma hilla anayna bil yumni wal iman. Oh Allah, bring the moon upon us with yuman. Yuman is auspiciousness with good portents, good signs. And so the tayyaman is to go to the right and the tasha'um is to go to the left. Sham is the left. Shamal is left. So shimal, north, shamal. Yemen, yameen. Because when you face, if you're in Arabia, you know, if you face the east in Arabia, then Yemen is on your right and uh, Syria is on your left, which is Shamal, the north, Shimal, Sham. And it's not yet the Sham in Sham, you know, that you take a bad omen from Sham. The Prophet took good omen from Sham. Barakallah fi Yamanina wa Shamina. And then what's behind you? Al Gharb. What's Gharb? Gharib, what you can't see. It's what you don't know. So Gharib is, is the West. It's what you don't know. So that is the cosmology of the, of the pre-modern Arabs. So wh wh what, what they're saying is, we're taking a bad omen from you. Natasha'am. You know, mm, the, the, uh, s some of the Mufassirun say the rain stopped when they came to the, the town. So they said, ah, you, because they, you, people are superstitious. You know, uh, people do funny things like knock wood. That's a pagan thing because pagans used to worship wood, knock wood. People do that. And you can't get rid of superstition. The Prophet ﷺ said that qira is in human beings. It, we're all superstitious. You can't get it. You cannot get rid of superstition. It's just a human quality. And it's amazing that he said that because his religion is so anti-superstition. But it's just a human quality. It's part of our nature to be superstitious. So they, but what, what they say is that ignorant people always take bad omen from things they don't like and good omen from things they like. Because they're following their hawa. They're following their nafs. They're not following their reason. And that's why Maybe you hate a thing and it's a good for you. And maybe you love a thing and it's bad for you. Who knows? Allah knows. Allah knows and you don't know. So intelligent people take good uh, omen from good things and, 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 and they don't really concern themselves with bad omen. The Prophet He was optimistic. The Prophet ﷺ liked uh, optimistic things. He liked auspicious things. If he heard somebody say, Ya Sa'id, it used to make him happy just to hear that. Like somebody calling another person and they would say, Ya Sa'id. And he would hear that, it would make him happy. Just to hear Ya Sa'id. He was, the Prophet ﷺ was optimistic. In fact, 
Optimism is a fard ain, really. You can't be pessimistic. You can be realistic, but you can't be pessimistic. You know, you have to believe that things are for the good because we believe in a, in a, in a merciful Lord. And so what they say is, you know, If you don't stop preaching this, we're going to, we're going to uh, stone you. And and you will taste from us a painful punishment. That your ta'ir is from you. This is amazing. You know, this is again the Quranic, it's always driving home, things are from you. Your, your, your superstition is from you. It's not from anything that happened outside. Look into yourself. That's the source. If you're seeing the world as a negative place, it's because of what's in you. If you're seeing it as a positive place, it's because of what's in you. You are the cup and what you fill your vessel with, either negative things or positive things, faith or disbelief, courage or cowardice, it's all in you. And what is in you is going to determine how you react in creation or how you act, how you respond. It's all in us. And, and we have been given volition. We can control these things. It takes effort and practice. That's what mujahada is. It takes effort to contain the self. The ego can be known. You don't free yourself from your ego. But you can learn the tricks of the ego. You can learn to identify when you're reacting from your ego and when you're reacting when you're acting in accordance with your highest nature. You can begin to determine these things. And so this is what they say. And, and then uh, they say, قَالُوا طَائِرُكُمْ مَعْكُمْ Because of this kufr. in uh, ذُكِرْتُمْ You know, you, 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 you know, weren't you warned? Haven't you been given this, uh, this warning? بَلْ أَنْتُمْ قَوْمٌ مُسْرِفُونَ You are a people who are transgressing the limits. And this is an important concept in the Quran, the concept of Israf, that people uh, transgress the boundaries. They go beyond the boundaries. One of the things, in Allah, uh, God doesn't like the people of Israf. And the Ikhwan Shayateen are called Mubadhirin, the people that uh, are people of Tabdeer, of excess. They, they you know, we're people of moderation. We should be moderate in our eating. We should be moderate in our sleeping. We should be moderate in all of our, even your ibadah should be moderate. If you go to extremes of either too little or too much, then you're not following the sunnah of the Prophet and, and his sunnah is not specifically what he did in, in, in himself because he, 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 first of all, it was fard for him to get up every night and pray. He used to pray half or a third of the night in ibadah, which was moderate for a person who prays all the night or doesn't pray any of the night. So he, he was moderate in those two extremes. But his sunnah is to get up in the night. How much you do that is related to who you are, what you're, the time you're living in. All those things are related. But that is a sunnah of the Prophet. It's a nafida. It's something that you draw near to Allah. But if you're praying and fasting, your body's getting weak, you're not giving your spouse their rights, you've gone to Isra, you're in Tajawuz uh, al you've gone beyond the limits. And so that is what, that's the Israf that the Quran is attacking. We tend to forget that extremism is from both perspectives. You can be extreme in not doing enough, and you can be extreme in doing too much. One of the things when I was on Capitol Hill, I was asked to talk about extremism in Islam, and I just said, you know, America is the most extremist country in the world. We have extreme sports. We have extreme eating. We're the only country I know that has hot dog eating contests where people will eat 150 hot dogs, which is, it's not only dangerous if you're a physician, but it's something, it's just humanly degrading. We have extreme, you know, pornography. This country is filled with extreme sexual attitudes, you know, from prudery to uh, just the, the most degrading types of things. 
so many aspects of extremism in our culture. It's not balanced. And we have extreme violence. We're an extremely violent culture. We have more murders than any better. People who have grown up in Muslim countries, I mean, alhamdulillah, the safest places I've ever been to in my life have been Muslim countries. The only thing you have to worry about is the ruler. <laughs> You know, I mean sometimes, but generally even the rulers, you know, they, mash al hal, like they say, you know. Min hun lil hun mashi. That's what the Syrians say. From here to here, make it walk. So the, and then it says that, وَجَاءَ مِنْ أَقْصَى الْمَدِينَةِ رَجُلٌ يَسْعَى and a man from the furthest part of the city. Isn't what a beautiful, it's just such a beautiful, the Quran has all these beautiful subtleties. You know, he came from the furthest part of the city. He made this effort, you know, and the reward, because didn't it tell us about the, that Allah, نَكْتُبُ مَا قَدَّمُوا وَآثَارَهُمْ we, we record their efforts in walking, in going farther distances for the truth. And here's a, an example of somebody practicing that. This is a man who, according to the tradition, he met the apostles before they went into the city and they cured his son of an illness that he had been suffering for a long time. And he believed, he, used, he was a, a carpenter that used to make idols for the people in the city. His name's Habib al Najjar, according to the tradition, Wallahu Alam. But he, when he heard that they were persecuting these men and he knew how truthful they, they were and he was from the people, he came running. Yes, ah. It's so beautiful, you know, that his, that, قال يا قومي, this is isti'taf in the Arabic language. One of the things that prophets and du'at say is they talk to their people. They remind them, I'm, I'm one of you. I'm not against you. I'm not a foreigner. People that come from other places and preach to a people, sometimes they see them as foreigners and they reject them. That's not always the case. Sometimes those are the people that accept the, the prophet and he's rejected by his own people. It goes both ways. But prophets always talk to their people, Ya qawmi, Ya qawmi, Inni Rasulullah ilaykum, Ya qawmi, Allah, Ya qawmi. It's throughout the Quran you see this, Oh my people, Oh my people. So this is what he said, Ya qawmi, Attabi'un mursaleen, Follow these apostles, follow them. He's counseling them, giving them good advice. So he's a duat. Follow them. They're not asking a reward. They're healing your sick. They're treating your people, and they're not asking for money. They're not asking you for any money to do this, which is very important about this. The Muslims traditionally have always been people of nasiha. They've always been people of good works. They've always been people of free hospitals, free clinics, feeding the poor. We forget that aspect is so central to our tradition. The Prophet ﷺ had a soup kitchen in his house. He fed 70 homeless people every single day for his entire period in Medina. That's our prophet. That, if you want a sunnah of the prophet, there's people that take his sunnah of ibadah and they don't take his, his sunnah of welfare, of helping people. He had a soup kitchen. He used to make soup in his house. And they would take, when people brought food to him, he would always send it to the Ahl Sufa. 70 on average, more or less. Abu Huraira was amongst them. From them came great scholars. From them came rulers. Salman al-Farisi was one of the Ahl al-Sufa. He ends up a governor in Persia. Allahu Akbar. What a religion to take homeless and turn them into scholars and rulers. Just rulers. It's amazing. What a beautiful religion. It's just, it really, it's so beautiful. And so this is what he's saying. Look, they're not asking you for money. They're not charging you for this knowledge. They're doing these things for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They said to him, Because they know Habib al Najjar, he makes their idols. <laughs> He's a nice guy. What's happened? They say, Are you from amongst them? He said, And what, you know, why should I not? Malia. You know, it's a really interesting way to frame a question. He could have said, Shouldn't I? You know? 
or I should worship, but he said, what's wrong with that? Because when you're talking to people that are denying something, it's a very good way of asking them, what's wrong with it? What's, what's bothering you about it? The one who فطرني, who originated me. He says created me, which is true. Fatr is the creator, but Khaliq is closer to our word creator. Fatara is originator. The proof for that is uh, that Ibn Abbas did not know what Fatr meant because it wasn't a Qurayshi term. And he once heard two Bedouin came to him and they were arguing about a well. And one of them claimed it before the other, and he said, Ana fatartuha. I, w- I was the one that originated the well. He didn't create the well. He originated it. So father is, and it might be a cognate with father. You know, there might be a relationship with the word father, because father in Sanskrit means originator, progenitor. So there might be, I mean, there's linguistic relationships between uh, Semitic language and uh, Aryan languages. They're, they're, they're words that are shared. There's no doubt, and that can be proved. Um, Zeus is very similar to that. You know, Zeus, Theos, Ta, Sin, Ta are similar. They're, they're the sibilant and dental, but they're very close in their points of articulation. There are many examples of that. You can go crazy with these type theories also. So I'm not, I don't, uh, but they're interesting nonetheless. And, and uh, we, we have a great lexicographer in this country who was named um, Webster, Noah Webster. Does any, did anybody know about Noah Webster? Uh, obviously Webster's dictionaries are named after him. But Noah Webster in, in the 1820s, uh, set out to prove that English was from Hebrew. He was a very devout Christian, Protestant, and he wanted to prove that English was from Hebrew. Well, the interesting thing is he ended up proving it was from Arabic. So if you read his original, uh, it, 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 I have a copy of it. It's, it's a dictionary that was published in 1828, Noah Webster's original dictionary. You can get a facsimile copy of it. He actually has the Arabic in the dictionary which is amazing. They were typesetting Arabic in America in the 1820s. I mean, just fascinating. Uh, But he shows how, like cave, he said cave, kaf, uh, earth, ard. So he gives all these examples of, you know, baby, baboos. (laughs) He goes on and on. It's it's very intriguing. But uh, so, Allahu anam, some say that uh, father, I mean, Dr. Omar wrote this, and, and, and I, I don't know where, he actually mentioned this, that Ibn Taymiyyah mentioned this, but I did, I've never seen this, but I will s- say this just, and with that caveat, I trust Dr. Omar because he's, he's an extraordinary scholar, and he's a dabit. Um but he said that father was actually a name for God in, in, before Islam, and that's why it's used, but because of the anthropomorphic danger of that name, Islam, in a sense, abrogated that name. So, Allahu Adam, you know, uh, about that. But he did mention that in one of his uh, essays. So, this is what he's asking. Do you take from beside God, gods? Right? Do you take them uh, beside gods? And, and, you know, and... If God wants to harm anyone or anybody, then their intercession won't help you. I mean, one of the things of the idolaters, some of them worshipped gods to draw them near. You know, we only worship them to draw us near to God through shafa'a. We intercede with the gods. We worship them to get close to God. Um, that's a type of shirk, to ask the intercession of idols to God, um, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is accessible to everyone at any time, which does not mean that you can't intercede uh, in asking people to make dua for you. You can't. That's a type of intercession. But it's an intercession with the understanding that you think that's a real person who's close to Allah. So if I say to you, make dua for me, that's a type of shafa'a. There's nothing wrong with that. 
The khilaf is about living and dead people. That, that's where you get into big debates about whether dead people can still make dua for people. And I don't even want to go there because it's, it's just, it's, it's, it's one of those can of worms that uh, has endless uh, discussion on it. But this shafa'a is agreed upon that you can ask a living person to, uh, to make intercession for you. When you go to Mecca, pray for me at the Kaaba. That's from the hadith, Uthkurni and Rabbika ya ukhay. When Sayyidina Omar was going to Mecca, the Prophet asked for dua. He doesn't need Omar's dua. Omar needs his dua, but he was teaching the community that if you see good in a person, ask for their dua. So then he says, uh, if I did that, uh, and then he says, They can't save you or help you. I would be clearly wrong. I believe in your Lord. Look how he says, he doesn't say, Rabbi. He's reminding them, he's your Lord too. You just haven't believed in him yet. I believe in him. So listen to me. They kill him. This isn't in the narrative like this, but they kill him and it said, enter into the garden. So he said, if only my people knew. This is so beautiful, really, people. If only my people knew how my Lord has forgiven me and set me among the highly honored. Because he was a martyr and they, it said that they burnt him, they stoned him, some said they sawed him in half, which the prophet mentioned about Christians, that they were sawed in half and they still had their faith. And that's why don't complain about searches at the airport. Yeah, really, because you know, it's just, it's not that big of a deal. So the, he honored me, how my Lord has forgiven me, set me among the high land. Habib al-Najjar, this is somebody who was sincere to his people in life and even after he dies because his soul left his body and went directly to paradise which is a proof that the martyrs go directly to paradise but once he saw what he was given the first thing he thinks about is his people and this is what Ibn Ajiba says every day no matter what his people do to them if he's true and sincere in his da'wah, he wants good for them. He doesn't want them to be harmed or punished, no matter what they do, because they understand what hell is. They understand what paradise is. They understand what forgiveness is. And they also understand that in the end, everything is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That he was martyred by the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is a beautiful testimony to forgiving people for even when they do the worst and most heinous things to you. If you're sincere in your da'wah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَمَا أَنزَلْنَا عَلَىٰ قَوْمِهِ مِن بَعْدِهِ مِن جُنْدٍ مِّنَ السَّمَاءِ وَمَا كُنَّا مُنزِلِينَ After him we did not send any army from heaven against his people, nor were we about to إِنْكَانَتْ إِلَّا صَيَحَةً وَاحِدًا فَإِذَا هُمْ خَامِدُونَ In other words, we don't need to send armies. We don't need to. People can be destroyed. A tsunami can destroy them. An earthquake can destroy them. Do you feel so safe that God can't just swallow you up in the earth? That Allah can, and we have to be careful. Alas for human beings. Another beautiful statement. Because it's real. And this is the heart of the Quran. This is Qalb al-Quran. It's caring about people. It's wanting people to benefit from this call to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya hasaratana ala al-ibad. Oh, alas, hasara for these servants. They're all servants of Allah. Ma yatihim mir rasulin illa kanu bihi astahzi'un. Messengers come and they ridicule. Why do they have to ridicule? Take them seriously. You might not believe in them, but don't make fun of them. Do they not see how many generations we have destroyed before them? None of whom will ever come back to them. 
Look at how many people have gone before. We go visit the sites of ancient people that are no longer here. They're gone. Some of them, their languages are gone. One of the most, uh, when I was in eighth grade, the first poem that ever really hit me was Ozymandias by uh, uh, Shelley, you know, about, you know, look on my works, O ye mighty, in despair. I am Ozymandias, king of kings. You know, this man, he's a, a traveler in the desert, and he comes upon a, a visage, a face, and it's half in the sand, and, and it's just ruins. And then he sees the thing on the, the, I am king of kings. And he's reflecting on how this king of kings is, even his monument is gone. You know, people are so arrogant. They walk the earth thinking they're going to be here forever. And Allah's reminding us, Yet all of them will be brought before us. Everyone. They'll all be brought before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is important because now Allah is going back to a central theme of Yasin, the ba'ath, the resurrection. He's told us that the messengers came. They told them, look, you're going to be resurrected. And you're going to be accounted. Now Allah is giving an example to a people who don't believe in resurrection. So you have to understand the mentality. Like here, many people believe in resurrection. But in Arabia, they didn't believe in resurrection. They literally thought that there was nothing after death. The best you could do is be immortalized in a poem. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he brings back a dead earth to life. And he brings forth these things that you eat from. So not only do you see the dead earth back to life, but the dead earth back to life is sustaining you. It's sustaining your own life. So death becomes life, generates life, perpetuates life. And then you too will die. It's amazing. So we come from the dead. It's, it's really quite a, a extraordinary uh, what point is being driven home. We put gardens of date palms and grapes in the earth and we've made springs of water gush, gush forth out of it. Which of the bounties of your Lord are you denying? Look at the sustenance. We've given you date palms and grapes. We've given you fruits. We've given you all these different things. What's wrong with you? We've given you the taste of cherries, the taste of berries, all these wonderful things. And, and what, we could have given you rocks that you had to crush to eat, and that would have been our sustenance. We could be like the dung beetle that takes the dung and has to eat that. Seriously. Allah could have done all these things. He made our food come from that. Our food comes from manure, but He could have made manure our food. And we would have just had to eaten it. But he doesn't. <laughs> so you can eat from its fruit that you pick. And then the mahir can be uh, anafia. It can negate, but it can also be 10 minutes. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just getting started. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> The, the ma could, could be anafia, ma amirat hu aidihim, that their hands didn't make it, but it could also be masdariya, what their hands made. So you eat not only from the fruit, but also from what your hands make. So it has both meanings. The, the meaning of negation is like saying, look, you don't even have any work in it. You just go and pick berries out in the, in the forest. We used to be hunter-gatherers, and it was all done for us. And then we became agrarian people and our hands did it. So it has both meanings, hunter, gatherer, people, nomadic people that don't really have to do much to get their sustenance, and then the people that uh, make it from their hands. So it could be either what your hands make, you eat from that, or, and your hands didn't make it, won't you show gratitude? And then now moving to an even deeper in terms of proofs, that look at all these things that you're eating and you're subhana ladi kharaqa al-azwaja kullaha mimma tumbit al-ard wa min anfusihim wa mimma la ya'lamun glory be the one who created pairs of all things even now we know that there's male and females in uh, the, 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 uh, the, uh, 
the flora of the, of the earth, not just in, in the flora, not just the fauna. So, and also even pairs in, 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 the, in the atomic world. You know, there's negative and positive charges. Everything's in pairs. Why would, why would we be reminded of pairs here at this point? If everything's in pairs, what would be the point of really bringing this out right now? Because it's going to be driven again further home with the next verse about night and day, because that's a pair. But what's, what, what, if you're talking about the bath and the resurrection, why would you start talking about pairs? Life and death, this world and the next world. Just like this world, there is a pair to this world, which is the next world. And it's the opposite. Just like this world is temporal, that world is eternal. Just like this world is mixed with pleasure and pain, that world is either pure pleasure or pure pain. It's all opposites. Everything is opposites. It's one of the secrets of the Quran. By the opposites, things are known. By this world, the next world is known. If you just use your intellects, if you use analogical reasoning, if you use your logic, it makes perfect sense. Beautiful, uh, really beautiful uh, isti'ara here. That we strip the night. Have, who's seen like these computer images of the earth spinning around and how it's just like salkh, like the night and the day. It's literally like stripping it away. So the light and the darkness of the earth as it moves around the sun, this is like salkh. It's also nukawiru, like takwir, like a turban, winding a turban. So the, the night and day are being wound like this. It's really, these are very, very powerful images, but they're also extraordinarily accurate in terms of what we now know about things because this was obviously not known. The Arabs actually thought that the sun set and that was it. And then in the morning it rose up. The Egyptians believed that it was carried across, you know, by the, the god Thoth or something like that, carries it across the river. I mean, these were all the mythologies. This is saying, no, it's selkh. It's being stripped. It goes from one to the other. Taqweer. It's going around. And this is why even the early Mufassirun mentioned there's two opinions. The sun disappears and that it actually goes to other places on the earth. So the ulama knew this early on before. Uh, and the Prophet talked about Mashariq al ard wa Maghrib. You know, Tuwiyat li al ard. Faraaitu Mashariqaha wa Maghribaha. The earth was shown to me. Tuwiyat. It was rolled up in a ball. And I was seeing the whole earth, and I saw the different easts and wests of the earth. So the Prophet actually had the vision of these different easts and wests as the earth's moving. So, moon. You know, we strip the, we take the daylight away, and suddenly they're in darkness. Isn't it amazing how it's just stripped from us? It's there, and then it's gone. والشمس تجريري مستقر لها ذلك تقدير العزيز العليم and the sun is moving to its determined course some of the ulama say this means every day and some say no it's at the end of time it's moving to a determined course of time when it comes to an end we now know that it has a determined course we know that the sun in our physical sciences we know that the sun is going to come to an end and that's consistent with, with that meaning that ulama talked about centuries ago. So it's, it's, it's quite extraordinary how accurate this is. It could also be interpreted also that tajri and the Prophet mentioned in a hadith to Abu Dhar about the earth taking idhan from its Lord, which is also possible. Because let me just give you one example of how limited we are in our understanding. We know that the Isra happened in a very short period of time, and yet the Prophet had experiences that went on for hours and hours and hours. We know that. And yet the time was expanded out. So we know that time is, is you can blink your eye and how many worlds could have been born and destroyed and lived their lives in that blink. Allah is qadirun ala kulli shay. We don't know where the sun is right now. I can point to it right there, but even we know that there's eight minutes have passed before that light actually reaches my eyes. So I'm not even seeing the sun where it is. So just 
They have not given God his true estimation. When you read hadith, don't think they sound outrageous or what well, that's not consistent with science. No, we know nothing. You've only been given a tiny bit of knowledge. Don't become arrogant. Don't assume things. The most humble scientists are the great scientists. Richard Feynman who won the Nobel uh, Prize in, in physics for quantum electrodynamics, said physics is the expanding horizon of our ignorance. And he was not joking. He wasn't being flippant or glib. He was saying the more we know, the more we don't know. But man, man is arrogant. So this is, this is what Shamsu Tajiri Alim. It's a laid course. It's so accurate. The amount, the 365, the, 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 the 360 degrees around which the, it moves in its circle. It's, it's extraordinary. And also, you can have a Mubtada and Khabar, or you can have Mansub here, but Ishtigal. ورش is والقمر والقمر قدرناه منازل حتى عاد كالعجون القديم I would love to go into this verse uh, considerably but I'm not going to be uh, my time doesn't allow it but the, the moon is one of the great signs of Allah the manazil are the positions of the moon throughout their 28 positions they relate also to the 28 letters of the uh, Arabic alphabet they also relate to the uh, menstrual cycle uh, of women uh, there are many many things that these manazil they're a big sign from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and uh, we, we can determine them with great accuracy uh, for people that are interested in this I wrote a an essay called Caesarean Moonburst, which talks a lot about Muslim knowledge of uh, the moon and how accurate they were in determining when the new moon would be born, when it would appear. They had very sophisticated uh, charts, visibility charts, that over a thousand years ago, Al-Baruni made very accurate visibility charts. They knew when the moon would show up. It's not new science. We haven't re really... Ob observational astronomy has improved very little. Uh, the only improvement is the telescope that allows us to see things in far distances. But naked eye observational astronomy was actually better known by the ancients than it is known by modern people. Even modern uh, astronomers know very little about the naked eye sky. There's some astronomers that couldn't even point out constellations to you, but they're, they're masters of their science of modern astronomy. لا الشمس ينبغي لها أن تدرك القمر ولا الليل سابق النهار وكل في فرق يسبحون. The sun cannot overtake the moon. The reason that the sun is used and not the moon is because the the moon does in one month what the sun takes a year to do. So the 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 sun does not speed up like the speed of the moon. If it did, everything would be disrupted. All the seasons would be destroyed. We wouldn't be able to survive. So the sun has this taqdeer that enables us to live uh, by the sabab. Another sign for them is that we carried their seed in the laden ark. And we have made similar things, camels, which are called sufun al-sahra. They can ride on them so we can get through deserts. Uh, if we want, uh, we could have drowned them. There would be nobody to help call out to and uh, nobody to save them. No 9-11. If Allah wants to uh, drown people on the ocean. In fact, uh, Sidi Ahmed Zarruq said one of the great, in his, his commentary on the Hizb al-Bahr, he said one of the greatest proofs of the Rahmah of Allah is sailors. Because he said they're some, often some of the most dissipated people, you know, just profligate people that do terrible things. No offense to any sailors, but I mean, we say in English, it would even make a sailor blush. That's an English expression. In other words, there's no shame in sailors. So he said the fact that sailors can cross this vast ocean safely is such a proof of the look of Allah. <laughs> Anyway, I've offended sailors. I apologize. إِلَّا رَحْمَةً مِنَّا وَمَتَاعٍ إِلَى حِينٍ 
only by our mercy. And this is reprieve. They've been given the enjoyment of life for a short period. And then they are told, beware of what lies before and behind you so that you may be given mercy. And yet they ignore every single sign that comes to them from their Lord. And if it's said to them, give out uh, from what Allah has given you, those who disbelieve say uh, to those who believe, why should we feed the ones uh, that had God wanted? He would have fed them. And even some of the Muslims started doing this when this ayah was revealed because had God wanted, they, they, he would have fed them. That's a kind of, it's a certain view in some strains of Christianity that wealth is a sign God's pleased with you and poverty is a sign that he's displeased with you, which is why some people are so against any forms of welfare to help people. You know, let them pull themselves up by the bootstraps. Well, what if they don't have bootstraps? Then what do they do? So this is really addressing a disease in the heart of people that don't have compassion for people that are less fortunate than they are, assuming that this is from God. And circumstances are circumstances. If you're born into poverty, it's hard to get out of it. Some people do, but they're unusual. They usually write best-selling books and things like that. And everybody says, well, look, see, he did it, you know. وَيَقُولُونَ مَتَى هَذَا الْوَعْدُ إِن كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ And they say, when is this threat? You know, if, if, when is this promise going to be fulfilled if you say what's true? مَا يَنْظُرُونَ إِلَّا صَيْحَةً وَاحِدَةً تَأْخُذُهُمْ وَهُمْ يَخَصِّمُونَ They only are waiting for a single blast that will overtake them while they're still arguing with each other. SubhanAllah. فَلَا يَسْتَطِيعُونَ تَوْصِيَةً وَلَا إِلَى أَهْلِهِمْ يَرْجِعُونَ They don't have any time to, uh, to give any advice or to make any bequests or do anything. They don't have any time to return to their people. Habib and Najjar wished he could. Ya Layta Qawmi. He was wishing that his people knew that he could go back and tell them. Wa sur, And the trumpet will be sounded. This is a blast. There's two nafkha. Nafkha al-ula wa nafkha al-thaniya. The first blast brings the souls, it awakens them from their graves. And then the, 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 the second where they're brought forward um, and, and uh, taken to account by their Lord. Uh, and they will say, alas for us, who has resurrected us from our resting places? So the marqad, the grave, people initially have the, the trials in the grave and then, and then they go to sleep. And then they're waking up from, from that sleep. And that sleep, they, they, they suddenly realize that it's all real. They weren't dreaming. This is real. And that's why when people first die, they think they don't know if they're dead or alive. They're in that confused state, which is one of the reasons why some of the ulama say you recite Yasin to help the soul into the transition period. That's, that's one of the wisdoms that is given by the ulama because it's, it reminds them what they knew in the world. Because it's very disorienting when you die. As things are very different than they are here. And it's like waking up from a dream. And sometimes when you wake up from a dream, you're wondering, am I still dreaming? I mean, you can be disoriented when you wake up from a sleep. And so they're, they're suddenly realizing that what the messengers told us is true. A single blast, and lo and behold, they're all brought before us. Today, no soul will be wronged in the least, and you will only be repaid for your deeds. Again, ba'ath. Look at the focus on the ba'ath and why this is qalb al-Qur'an. The Qur'an is, is to prepare you for this momentous day. And this is really the heart of this message. Inna ashab al-jannah til yawma fi shughlim faqihun. The people of paradise today are happily occupied. They're, 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 they're visiting. They have fruits. They have uh, pure spouses. All of the, these things that they were promised are coming true. And the highest is to uh, visit their Lord. They and their spouses seated on couches in the shade. Even Imam Asawi says they get to listen to beautiful music. 
He actually says, Darb al Autar. Lahum fiha faqihatum warahum ma yadda'oon. There they have fruit and whatever they ask for. Whatever people desire is in paradise, but it'll be pure desires. It won't be impure things like in this world people desire impure things. It'll be pure things. Saramun qawnum ya rahim. They say that this is the heart of Yasin. When you enter paradise, the Prophet ﷺ said that people will be so overwhelmed with the peace and the sakina that they will begin to say salam, salam, salam. They're just feeling peace for the first time in their existence, a real peace, salam. And so this is a, a, a word from a merciful Lord. Step aside on that day, guilty ones. Imtazu. Everybody is going to be made clear. It's Yom al Furqan. It's the day of discrimination. It's the day when the debts fall due. It's the day when the Ashab al Yamin and Ashab al Shimal. Everything's made clear. Children of Adam, didn't I command you not to serve shaitan? Don't listen to the one that's going to take you away from preparation for that day to, and he'll make you amongst the mujirimeen. But to serve me, this is the straight path. He has led great numbers astray. Use your intellect. It's so clear. Guidance is clear in contradistinction to misguidance. So this is the fire that you were warned against. This is it. Enter it today. And, and people are going to be roasted in it because you went on ignoring. On that day, you shall be sealed up. Their, their mouths, the hands will speak, the, the bear witness. One of the amazing things in Sharia, there's a khilaf about this, but, but, but in the Maliki madhab, the Qadi cannot, la yaqdi bi ilmihi. It's not permissible for a Qadi to judge with his knowledge. And what that means is, if, if I'm a qadi and, and, and I'm walking to the courthouse and I see a man kill another man, I can't sit as a judge in his trial. I can be a witness, but I can't sit in judgment. You're, the judge has to be completely unbiased. Now, what's really interesting about that is the reason that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not judge us with his knowledge, even though he is the one most capable of judging us with his absolute knowledge, is he brings forth witnesses. It's all going to be, you're not going to have any, you can't say, you were unfair to me. You put me into this situation or that situation. You can't, he's going to, your hands are going to testify against you. I didn't want him to kill that man. He's the one that made me pull the trigger. I wasn't, I, the finger is going to say, I wasn't created to do that. The tongue, I, I didn't want to backbite. He's the one that made me do it. Because it's the heart. The qalb, it's the heart. يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَالٌ وَلَا بَنُونَ إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَى اللَّهِ on that day, no benefit, a sound heart. That's what's going to benefit you because all the limbs respond to a heart. If your heart is sound, the actions of the limb are sound. If your heart is not sound, the actions of the limb are unsound. And then, if it had been our will, we could have taken away their sight. They would have struggled to find the way. But how could they have seen it? Right? Allah gave us all this ability if it had been our will, we could have paralyzed them where they stood so they could not move forward or backward. We've been given all what we need to do good, to understand. Warsh is uh, whoever we extend their life to, we reverse his development. Life is a curvilinear thing. In other words, when you're young and have your energy, use it because you're going to lose it. And so uh, use what you've been given. Don't you use your intellects, the time you have. This is after saying all of this. Listen, Arabs, you love poetry. It's been your pastime before this book. This isn't poetry. 
This isn't about dallying with the ladies anymore. This isn't about drinking wine. This isn't about having a good time. This isn't about boasting about how great your tribe is. This isn't what you're, you're hearing. This is a, a message from God. Pay attention. We didn't teach him poetry. We didn't teach him to entertain you. This isn't entertainment. Poetry is, is enjoyable. There's edification. There's wisdom in poetry. This is not poetry. This isn't poetry. Mm -mm. It's not uh, appropriate for him. This is a reminder and a clear recital. Now we're back to Indar. To warn the one man kana hayyan, the one who has life, the one whose heart is life. A woman kana mayitan fa the one who was dead and brought to life with faith. So this is what will bring you to life. The one who is brought to kafirin and the God's verdict will be passed. I mean he says may be passed, which is actually nice. I like that. Because that there is a, a position and it's a strong position that even there are people that are in disbelief that, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going, it's may. He, Allah can forgive whom he pleases. And Imam Ali radiallahu anhu said that God has told us about heaven and its people and hell and its people, but in the end, فَعَلُوا لِمَا يُرِيدُ He does whatever he wants. So Allah knows. There are people for the fire, Ashab al Jahim. But only Allah knows. Allah says, لا تجعلوا لله أندادن وأنتم تعلمون Don't set up idols beside God and you know what you're doing. There's ignorant people that do these things. Ahl al-Fatra, that uh, the dominant opinion is that actually they're, they're not going to be taken into account. They'll be judged, according to the Maturidi, they'll be judged by whether they were good or bad based on fitra. Like if they were evil to people and things like that. Uh, the Ash'ari is a little... Uh, I, I, it, I, to me personally, I, I'm more inclined to the, the Maturidi position on that. And then, Can't they see how we, among the things we made with our own power, with our own hands, we have created livestock they control. Uh, we made them obedient to skhir. These animals that could be wild, like lions. The sheep could be like lions, but they're not. They do what you tell them to do. The shepherd, even a little boy, can tell them where to go. So this is imtinan. Yamunnu alaykum. Allah is al-mannan. He reminds you of his blessings. وَلَهُمْ فِيهَا مَنَافِعُ وَمَشَارِبُ أَفَرَا يَشْكُرُونَ Again, shukr. Aren't you, won't you give thanks? You have all these benefits and drink and all these things. Yet they have taken God's beside Allah to help them. Though they, these could not uh, do so, even if they called the whole army of them together, don't get depressed or distressed. We know what they conceal and what they reveal. Don't Don't be constricted about their plots, about what they're doing. Concern yourself with Allah. Preoccupy yourself with your Lord and your Lord will give you everything you need to take care of your enemies. And, and then also, uh, Again, the bath. Reminding us, didn't he see we created him from a drop of fluid? Insignificant. One of the Arabs said, how can man be arrogant? He begins as a vile fluid. He ends as a smelly carcass. And between the two, he carries around feces in his stomach. <laughs> you know, what, what, what's your basis for arrogance? You know? 
So he's saying, look at man, he comes in, and then he's, he's arguing, like he was a little drop of fluid, and now he's saying, I don't believe in God, you know. I don't owe gratitude to anybody. Well, who does the atheist say thank you to when he feels grateful just for being alive? Just have a nice meal. Like Richard Dawkins said in his book, uh, you know, that he had this wonderful meal with his atheist friend, and, and they were talking about how enjoyable life was. Okay, well, so you're just an ingrate? You don't have any gratitude for that? That enjoyment, where that came from, the source of it? It's just the universe. You, I'm grateful to the universe. That's just a new age word for God. <laughs> right? Mother Nature. He starts setting up these likenesses to us and he forgets his own creation. He says, who will bring these bones back to life after they've decayed? That's the atheist. Who's going to do this? Say the one who did it in the first place. He has knowledge. He's done it one time. You're here. You weren't here. Now you're here. You're going to not be here again. You don't think it can happen a second time. You actually are starting to say you can do it a second time. With cloning. There's people that are now freezing themselves for fortunes in cryonic solutions after they die. They have wills and they get put into ice chambers believing that scientists are going to be able to revive them a second time a hundred years from now and yet they don't think God can do it. La ilaha illallah. Ah, the kufrun mubin. <laughs> Unbelievable. It is believable. Look how he took a, 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 a moist uh, tree that won't even start on fire. Like if you put a moist log into the fire, try to start it. And yet, you can take a dried one and do the twigs together like they teach you in the Boy Scouts, and you can get fire out of it. So you, don't, you can bring fire from this dead wood and you don't think God can bring the fire of life back from your dead bones? These are amazing uh, examples of the, the bath. You know, Allah makes fire out of wood? <laughs> think about that. It's amazing. It's there. You just do it long enough. Is he who created the heavens and the earth not able to create the likes of these people? He created the heavens. Are you more difficult or the heavens? He created, there's a, a weak hadith, it's an interesting hadith, that there's other worlds that have people on it that have never disobeyed Allah and they don't even know Iblis exists. We're here in our arrogant little corner of the universe thinking that it all revolves around us. I'm so important. Who are you? Who, who are you? And this is the nice, in the Quran, Allah exalts us and then abases us because he wants us to be in the middle. He wants us to know that we have worth, but he also wants to know that we can be worthless. And we decide. When he wills something, he just says, be and it is. So glory be to him whose hand lies control over all things. It is to him that you will all be brought back. Jazakumullah khairan. You didn't think I would get through, but I did it. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs>